go ahead and bring to order the uh, November 18th meeting of the Texas Department of License and Regulation. Uh, Ms. Mayhem, if you could call roll, please. Mike Harris Mendez. Present. Tom Butler. Present. Lou Ann Morgan. Here. Fred Moses. Here. Catherine Wodroll. Here. Robbie Shaw. Here. Deborah Yurko. Here. We do have a full commission. We have a quorum. Uh, prior to rolling going on to D, I'd like to jump to uh, <coughs> <laughs> I believe that the uh, audit finance committee met earlier. Uh, Commissioner Yurko, if you'd like to state anything about that. Um, this is Commissioner Yurko, and we did have the um, internal audit presented um, according to plan this morning. And do we need to move to adopt it, Brian? Uh, yes, uh, please uh, uh, vote of the commission to adopt okay. the internal audit plan after your any discussion okay. or questions that you might have for the, okay. the auditors. And I believe everyone has a copy of the audit plan? Yeah. Yeah. Annual audit report. Yeah, I'm sorry, the yeah. annual audit report. Yeah, as you'll recall, when we were here in July, 
to approve the audit plan, we were recommending the AV program and the IT department. Um, when we had discussions with the audit committee, there was a modification to that already where we eliminated the IT area and we were, um, the, the suggested audit was the elevators program. So we did go forward with the elevators program and the AV program. Yes, okay. Commissioner, any questions? Jim and I have a question. I, I don't have a problem supporting the audit. Uh, even though we've got in the last minute here, um, because I know there's a continuation from our other uh, review that we did in, uh, I think, mid-year. My question is, did you include all the other um, programs that PDLR is inheriting we, in the audit? In the um, internal audit plan that you'll have before you in 2016, that is what we will have the additional um, programs. Okay. Because once we... Um, we haven't had a chance to do the risk assessment. So as, as, as part of that process, we will be updated on, on the new programs to be included in the risk assessment, and that's where you will see those new programs. I appreciate that. Thank yes. you. Any further questions? Thank you, Kim. Um, we have a motion and a second. No further discussion. Uh, all in favor, seeing by the same Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate your support. <coughs> we'll now move on into uh, item D, which is executive session consultation with staff attorneys to section 551071 uh, of the uh, government code to receive a briefing from the general counsel concerning the pending of contemplated litigation and or settlement offers. Adopting the general counsel will be made and authorized by 551072. And under 551074, the government's no discussion of the bill matters. It is uh, 8.56. And I've got Commissioner Yurko trying to steal my microphone. Uh, we'll go ahead and... Uh, Come back into our regular meeting. Uh, there is no action to be taken, so uh, agenda item E is done. We'll move on to agenda item F, approval of minutes. Which of the editors is in front of you? Had a chance to take a look at it. I'll take any motion. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item G, let's get on to contested cases. Welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Trevor Thielen. I represented TDLR at the SOA hearing against John A. Johnson, where the department presented evidence that Mr. Johnson offered unlicensed air conditioning work during a sting operation we conducted in El Paso in 2012. The ALJ found that Mr. Johnson committed this violation and assessed a $1,000 penalty. After the ALJ issued the PFD, Mr. Johnson's attorney contacted me and agreed to support the adoption of the PFD as written if I would do so as well. I agreed with the ALJ that a $1,000 penalty is appropriate based on the specific facts of this case, and I recommend you adopt the PFD as written. If you have any questions, I can answer. Is there anyone here for uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Johnson himself? Commissioner, any questions for Mr. Keeble? Okay, a motion. I'll go ahead and check in there. We have a motion to adopt the PFD and second on the favor of taking five to say nine. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carried. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rennick. Sure. Agenda item two, Scott Ryan. Commissioners, Robert Rennick from the uh, Enforcement Division. In this case, commissioners, we're, we are going to ask the commission to reject the PFD, and uh, and in the PFD, the ALJ has recommended that the commission not revoke an apprentice electrician license, and that the commission uh, issue a provisional apprentice sign electrician license. We obviously are seeking to revoke and seeking to deny. It. In 2009, uh, the respondent was placed on deferred adjudication for two years for indecent exposure. 
In 2011, the court revoked that community supervision and found him guilty and sentenced him to three days in jail. On the same day that the respondent was originally placed on deferred for indecent exposure, he was convicted of evading arrest, also a misdemeanor. Now, both crimes occurred on September 28th of 2008, when two teenage girls, one of whom was the daughter of a police detective, were riding their bicycles in a residential neighborhood uh, around Amarillo. The respondent, driving a Honda, drove by them slowly and exposed his genitals <coughs> to them. The policeman's daughter rode home to tell her father, who immediately drove off to find the person who did this. He saw the respondent and attempted to make a traffic stop. The respondent fled in his car but was caught and the chase resulted in an evading <coughs> arrest conviction and in the indecent exposure deferred adjudication. Then in 2011, the respondent was convicted of possession of a controlled substance, lorazepam, a misdemeanor, and sentenced to nine days in jail. That crime occurred two years earlier on January 3rd, 2009. In May of 2014, the respondent was issued an apprentice electrician license because uh, of the uh, three the three crimes that I've just described to you uh, occurred a relatively long time ago. But then, in July of 2014, just two months later, the respondent was convicted of a second indecent exposure case and sentenced to 30 days confinement in jail. This one occurred in 2012. The respondent was naked in a park and running up to women in passing cars and masturbating. The department learned of the conviction in September of 2014 through an email from the Department of Public Safety. The department immediately opened a case to revoke the license. A month after the revocation case was opened, the respondent filed an application for an apprentice sign electrician license. And we opened a case to attempt to deny that. The respondent was born in 1985. He was approximately 23 years old when he committed the first indecent exposure and approximately 27 when he committed the second. It should be noted that the respondent filed a criminal history questionnaire form with his application in April of 2014. In the CHQ, the respondent stated that the indecency case in 2008 involved him simply peeing in an alley. The ALJ originally issued a finding of fact in her PFD in which she accepted the respondent's claim about peeing in and out. But after the department filed exceptions, the ALJ agreed to remove the language from the findings of fact. As stated earlier, neither indecent exposure had anything to do with the respondent urinating in and out. The commission may consider the fact that in connection with the application, the respondent filed a CHQ that was not truthful. That is, the conduct of a uh, applicant or a respondent before and after the crime that the commission, that the department alleges is a directly related crime can be considered by the commission. In this case, this is bad conduct because in connection with his application, he's telling us something that simply wasn't part of the crime that he was convicted of. The respondent presented no evidence of receiving sex offender counseling. At the hearing, he merely pronounced himself a changed man. The ALJ recommends that the commission issue a provisional apprentice sign electrician license and not revoke the apprentice electrician license. She was impressed by the fact that church members and the respondent's employer supported him. However, there is no evidence that any of his references knew exactly what he did when he committed these indecent exposure cases. And judging from the way the respondent untruthfully informed the department that one of his indecent exposure cases was simply urinating in public, it is hard to imagine that he told his references anything close to the truth. It is important to remember that indecent exposure can never be committed by simply urinating in public. Urinating in public is a separate and much less serious crime. 
the crime of indecent exposure has a sexual component to it. In both of his cases, the respondent under oath admitted that he exposed himself with the intent to arouse or gratify his sexual desire. There is no sexual component to urinating in public. Now, commissioners, you are aware that you have never issued, to my knowledge, a provisional license, and importantly, the law does not require you to issue a provisional license if an applicant has been convicted of an offense described by Chapter 53.021A, basically a Chapter 53 crime. In the department's opinion, both of the indecent exposure cases are offenses described by Chapter 53.021A because both crimes are directly related to the occupation. The respondent's behavior was truly bizarre. It was committed more than once. It was recent, and that type of conduct is unsuitable for a licensee in the department's opinion. So for the purpose of protecting the public, specifically women, and the department, the department recommends that the commission reject the PFP, revoke the apprentice electrician license, and deny the apprentice sign electrician license. Is there any questions you might have? Any questions, Mr. Mayor? Anyone here representing Scott Brown or Mr. Brown tonight? Thank you. 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 Thank you
let's go ahead and get started on the first one. Uh, Albert Morris, uh, DBA Pep Service. I believe Mr. Albert is here. So if you want to just come on up and set up here, you can, sir. Della. Good morning, Commissioners. Della Lindquist, Deputy General Counsel. This is a default uh, <coughs> motion for a hearing that results from a default order. Uh, it was sent to the correct address. It went unclaimed. Respondent alleged that he did not receive the notices and had, has some, had some trouble with the mail, but he provided no other evidence that he's had trouble with the mail or that the mail did not arrive. We recommend denying the motion for a hearing. Any questions from Ms. Lincoln? Mr. Lawrence, you don't mind state your name for the record and proceed uh, next. Good one, Lawrence. Go right ahead. Well, um, I was put in for the change of address a few years ago, and I guess they were sending the mail. I've been waiting for like two or three years on this, and I didn't get, I, didn't, I just didn't get the mail. I mean, I haven't had a problem with the mail uh, at my shop. And uh, so they finally uh, uh, sent it to my home address, and I got it, and I, and I responded to it maybe immediately. I mean, as soon as I got it, I mean, as soon as I got it at my home, my home address, my home address used to be my shop address. And they sent the information to my shop address, and I just didn't get it. And, uh, but I got it uh, at my home address, and I, man, I called them immediately as soon as I got it. But I've been waiting on this for, for a couple of years now to fight this. We've got an address of 2407 West Arkansas Lane, Suite E, Antigo, yes, sir. Texas. That yes, is sir. your That's my shop address that's now. That's your business address. Yes. 6700 Cottonwood uh, Court in Arlington. That's my home address. It used to be my business address. Okay. <coughs> so these are both correct addresses. Yes, sir. And we're showing that's what we sent it to. Yes, they, they sent it to my, sh my, I guess my shop first, and uh, uh, but I didn't get it. But as soon as they sent it to my uh, home address, I happened to be there, got the uh, uh, notification, and I called them immediately. I wasn't trying to ignore anything because I, I knew I didn't do anything wrong, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't ignore it at all. The NOAB still like, was the NOAB was sent on February 18, 2015 to the 2407 West Arkansas Lane address, which was his address that he had put in back in January of 2014, and it stayed the same until September 3rd of 2015. We changed it back to Copperwood. It, it's kind of gone back and forth from the Copperwood to uh, West Arkansas Lane over the course of the past few years, but as of the date this NOAB was mailed, uh, the address of record was 2407 West Arkansas Lane. The only reason I put it back to my home address because I wasn't getting my mail there like I should be getting it. So I put it back to my home address and as soon as I got it, I, I responded to it. So you haven't received any mail at the or, uh, Yeah, I was, I would be sent, I would. You're just not getting TLR mail? No, 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 that's not, no, no, that's not, I, I just didn't get, uh, I got all the notices that y'all was sending me for uh, uh, the, the quarterly notices. I would get every one of them. But they sent me a, 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 a I guess a, a what you call them things, a, a certified, certified mail. Letter. I didn't get that because I would have went because I'm never, I'm never at the shop and I don't have a secretary. I didn't get that and because uh, if I would have gotten it, I would have went and picked it up. And I wouldn't, I mean, I ain't doing anything wrong. Uh, uh, I, know, I know we're not here to discuss the case. Why would I ignore it? It was something simple. Was the mail claim? It went, it was returned to sender unclaimed, unable to forward. But as soon as they sent it to my address, my home address, I got it and I called it immediately right, right on the spot. So it was returned or it was. It like went on planes. Plane. Yes. Okay. I have a question. Ms. Lindquist, okay, so the NOAB went to the Arkansas Lane address. Where did the um, final order go to? Did it go to the Copperwood address? It went to both. Why didn't the person go to vote? Because he changed his address online in the middle of, of all of this. He changed his address back to Copperwood in September of 2015. You know why I changed it? It wasn't because of that. I changed it because I, when I uh, uh, renewed my license, I, didn't, I never got them. I renewed my license, I never got them, so I, I had to pay again. I kept calling and telling them they didn't send my license. I had to pay again and say, well, why don't you send them to my home address? And I got them at my home address. And so that's why I changed it in September. What, what are you because hoping, of this? What are you hoping to come out of this? 
I didn't want to fight this case because I didn't do anything wrong. I just want to retry, I mean, just see what's going on. But what happened, uh, uh, I guess I didn't have my license, y'all, y'all number on my, on my, uh, on my phone, on my invoice. So I, I, right. I, I, but you're hoping to be able to just re, just retry and take it back. Yes. So you want to start all over? I want to start all over. I mean, I don't want to just start all over. I just want to be able to defend myself. I can't well, do anything wrong. Be, that was probably start all over. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Yorker. Just like what you said, it went back and forth, back and forth. How many times did the address change? I just have a printout of, of his address changes, and I'd say um, from 2008, kind of going forward, 2011, um, 13, 15, I'd say three or four times. Well, my home address was my shop. Three or four years later, became my, I got my shop. And that's why I got changed in. And the only reason why I changed it back is because I didn't get this what she what we're here for, and I didn't get my license, my renewed license, at that shop address. So well, whoever I was talking to, uh, I told him, let's go and send it to my home address, because I'll get, I'll get all my mail here. And, and that's, how, that, that's how it happened. That's why I didn't change my address because of this. So the NLB went to the West Arkansas address? Yes. And was unclaimed. But every, now, now, every every piece of quarterly mail that y'all sent me uh, over the last three years, I got it at my shop address because it came in the mail. You but, mean they, not but, but when they put that, but when they put that, uh, uh, that that pink slip or something, I didn't get that. But I would have went and picked it up. Mr. So, counselor, do we have a uh, good address now? I believe the, the appropriate address as of now is Copperwood Court. Uh, still 24. So I just wanted my I just wanted my license to be sent to my home address because I wasn't I didn't get that then. I didn't change my license no more. I just wanted my license to come to my home. Address. I don't know what's home or shop. I have home 60, is 6700. That's people. the address as of September 3rd of this year is. Well, yeah. The only reason I told because I'm never at that shop, uh, uh, but I'm always I'm trying to come home <laughs> sometime, and, and that's the reason why I want uh, I responded so quick because I got the mail. <laughs> So is this the correct address? Is this the I still want my address to be 24-7 West Arkansas Lane. That's my shop. That's where my shop is at. I just wanted my license sent to my house. Well, we okay. we have a permanent mailing address that we, we send all department mail to, and we need to know what that needs to be. 24-7 West Arkansas Lane. Which is what we sent this to. All I'm saying. I, I understand what you're saying, but the issue is that we sent it to one address, and the address that we have on file is the Copywood address. Yes. But you're saying you don't want it there. Well, you I mean, want it to go to the West my Arkansas. Shop, my shop. I'm just saying, Sorry. you want to go to the West Arkansas address, and when we sent it there, you're saying you didn't claim it. Well, but that's where my shop is there, so I'm assuming I need all my mail to come there, but I mean, if I had to keep it at my home, that's fine. But, 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 but per the rules now, when you get a shop, right, you post the report that I, that I have a shop. But I didn't want to get my mail. The only reason why I wanted that mail to come to the, because I didn't, I didn't want this to happen. I, I, I didn't get my license. And on file, on file, uh, uh, you can see that I had to pay for my license twice. Did you get the uh, final order information to your uh, West Arkansas, to your shop? No, Did I got it at that? the house. I got it at the house. Because we sent it to both. But you sent it. You sent it. Uh, 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 certified, which I, which I believe. I mean, I understand you that. I didn't get that. I didn't get this the house and to the shop. Yes, I got. I got. I got. I got the one at the house. But one at the shop, I didn't get the pink slip. I happened to be at the house when they when they showed up. But the pink slip wasn't in the mailbox. So you and did not get the certified mail of the final order at your shop. The first one. Because we had the NOAB, which was sent to the shop. And then we had the final order to send to the shop. But you only sent a certified to, to my shop, and I didn't get that slip, so I didn't go pick it up. I didn't get the slip. I didn't know it was coming. Linguist, did we not send the final order to the shop also? We sent it to, to both addresses. To the shop the and the address, home address. I understand that, but you, you so, know. Uh, my question is this. The final order did you that we sent to your home address and to your shop, did you get both of those? I only got the final order from the, at, at the house. So that's when I got that pink slip, I called it meeting. So you're saying that you did not get the NOAB at the shop and you did not get the final order at the shop. You didn't get, because we sent you two at the shop. We sent you two certified mails to the shop. 
No, I, I didn't get the first one. Not, not one the shop. I didn't, I, didn't get one. I didn't get the certified mail at the shop. I didn't pick it up. I didn't get it. I didn't even get the slip. Neither one. At the shop. No, no man. Because you received a, a notice of the NOAB, you received that, mm -hmm. a certified mail, which you say you didn't get. And then when we issued the final order, we issued the final order and sent it to the shop and to your house. The only thing and you're I, saying the only thing that you got was a final order at the house. Yes, sir. Because it it's not even a big, a big case to, 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 to be, uh, I wouldn't want to be fined over three or four hundred bucks. I, I, would, I would rather just fight this the best way I can, but I know I didn't do anything. I wouldn't want to. I, I didn't get it. So, but as soon as I did get it, I hopped on it. Mr. Shop, just back to the question that I was asking. Do we have a good address? Yes, That's a good no? question. Um, the address we have right now to send all of our mail to you is 6700 Copperwood Court, Arlington, Texas. I'm assuming that's your address. And I'm going to get that mail all the time. And, 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 so you know, be fine. I came to this meeting knowing what exactly I was doing with this case, but you just overly confused me. You know, with going back and forth with which address to be. The, the agency cannot decide on what they need to send at what address based on your likes or dislikes. So, for the laughs, you know, I wouldn't mind rehearing this case because this is becoming more of a comedy than anything else. So, just for the commission, if the motion does go that way, I would be in support of rehearing this case just because to state and make sure that we have at least two addresses on file so that when we do rehear this case we at least know that both of those both of that information was sent to the of the rest of and for clarification this was a default yeah. so so what would happen if you if you granted the rehearing it vacates the default order <coughs> enforcement would send out another noab and possibly take which would be the Copperwood address Pardon me? Which would be the Copperwood address at this point in time. I have no idea. Yeah. That's the last one of record. Yes. Any other? Only reason we got the copper word address that second and third time, that second time, because I didn't get my real my license when I renewed it. That's the only reason why I did it. I, I put it back in Copperwood. I didn't get my license. Yes. Copperwood is its home. Yeah, yes. but I have a difficult time understanding why you're getting some mail from TLR, but the important ones you're not. Well, no, I'm not saying like, I'm not saying that you didn't get the, I didn't didn't get get the license, you didn't get the NOAB, you didn't get the final order, but you're getting the newsletters. He's not getting a certified mail. No, he's not. I just yeah. didn't get the certified mail. I didn't say I didn't get the, I didn't say I didn't get, you didn't the get your license either. I didn't get my license. That's what I'm saying. Why would I pay? Mail, okay. You're not getting it. Okay, why would I pay for it again if I didn't get it? I'm not asking you. That's not my question. I didn't, yes, sir. That's not my point. My point is, is that you're receiving all the mail from us except the license, except the NOAB, except the final order. But you're getting everything else from me. I didn't, I didn't get I didn't. I, I, I don't, I, I'm, and I, I'm not denying. I'm not saying that you did not get it. What I'm saying is that you yeah, didn't receive some of the other. Okay, I think Robbie made a motion. And I don't think it made a motion. It wasn't a motion, but I think it wasn't a motion. I would move that we, uh, we uh, approve a uh, motion to approve a motion for review. Thank you. Okay. What about a motion to second discussion? Uh, yes, Mr. Shaw. For the record, if Mr. Lawrence would, wouldn't mind at least getting with Della and making sure that we have at least two addresses. Preferably one address where we can send that information to you. Because whatever monster is taking away half the mail that's going from TDLR, I'd like to avoid that at the next I period. don't think a monster taking it. I didn't I'm see just that. saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I just want a chance to fight my case. And I hear you. I'm sorry. <clears throat> we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? I can tell you that I will be in support of this. Uh, I find it difficult to believe that you're getting half the mail and half the mail. So, I can tell you we've already closed the discussion. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. 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 Uh, you feel my call roll? I think it's fine too, but you feel my call roll? Sure. Tom Butler? No. Glenn Morgan? Yes. Fred Moses? Yes. Catherine Rothbold? Yes. Robbie Shaw? Yes. Deborah Yurko? No. Mike Harris Mendez? No. Motion carries 4 3. Someone from our staff will be in contact with you so you can begin the process. <coughs> Moving on to uh, item 2, Dorothy Moses. Um, if somebody could get with uh, Mr. Morris, I'm pretty sure that we have his correct address on top. So. 
Uh, we do have Don Lewis. I'm present. One of the responding to Arthur Moses. And Dorothy Moses. She's Feel free to sit up here if you'd she's like. She's also present. Also know that if, if you choose to speak, I will need one of these from her also. But at this point in time, we'll give them on the file. So, Della, proceed. <coughs> this is also a default order, and the default and the, the notice of violation and the notice of default were sent to the current address, but unclaimed. Apparently, uh, she appears to allege defenses to the case, uh, but does not allege error. Uh, she may be confused and believes she's being held responsible for the owner of the shop's responsibilities, but that's not the case. Uh, the, these violations relate to her specific area in the shop. We recommend denying the motion for rehearing. Any questions from Ms. Lindquist? Let me just uh, state also, I think, that this uh, Dorothy Moses and I had the same last name. I don't know if I can help her. How are you going to do it? I don't know if she's She recognized that also. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I asked her about it then. She said, you know. Let the record reflect that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's no recusal. <laughs> Mr. Moses, I guess you're saying you're not going to be accused from the case. I'm not. Okay. That's right. Okay. Any <laughs> questions for Ms. Lankwitz, though? All right. Mr. Lewis, if you don't mind, state your name to the record. I think you heard what I said prior to. If you don't mind, simply keep it to the point where you believe that we hear in our decision. Go right ahead. Good morning. Uh, my name is Don E. Lewis. I'm here for the respondent, Dorothy A. Moses. As you uh, are aware, I urged a motion on behalf, a motion for rehearing on behalf of the respondent, Darby and Moses. Um, it is based on, on the fact that there was an inspection that occurred on uh, approximately November the 12th, 2014. Uh, the notice of inspection, approval of the inspection, should be part of the record. Mrs. While Mrs. Moses, uh, <coughs> That proof of inspection states uh, the establishment as Bogart's uh, new look uh, shop and that indicates uh, Mr. Bogart, Albert Bogart as the owner. Uh, it does not indicate Mrs. Moses' license or anything related to her even though she is an operator at that business. Right? And excuse me, I will say, um we're straying a little bit from what's, it's a default. Um, well, just and, and I understand here, yeah. but this is the default. So uh, I understand. Case, but we're, we're, we're not allowed to be able to bring into sure. facts of this particular case that you brought before. It is simply how the commission erred in coming to the default order. And I think I was trying to lay a predicate for that. I understand, but let's get to the predicate. The predicate was that Mrs. Mm -hmm. Moses uh, uh, the proof of inspection that the allegations are based on is not something that Mrs. Moses uh, uh, was made aware of. And did I she received the uh, NOAB. And interestingly enough, uh, yeah, she did. Address. Yeah, she did receive an NO, NOAB. Okay. And interestingly enough, similar to the case before her, she contacted someone here at the department regarding that because she believed that it was in error. They were contacted by telephone, and at that point, it was indicated to her that there was a, a variance or something uh, that was going to be corrected with the proof of inspection. She did receive uh, a communication, and uh, a, a written communication from the department. I don't have a copy of it because after speaking with them, according to her, she indicated that she probably misplaced it or, or discarded it. She was surprised at the time that she she, she, she actually received the, the, the NOAB. So she did receive the NOAB? Yes, she did. And she received the final order? She was, um, well, actually, she received the final order in September, and that's when I got involved in reference to filing the motion for rehearing. But did not receive the NOAB? It was my understanding she received the NOAB, but she called. And the final order. She received the NOAB. She received a copy of the final order. Okay, so she received everything. But again, I think that the disconnect here is that when she, when because of the the nature of the proof of inspection, when she received the NOAB, she contacted someone with the licensing 
and it was indicated to her that the NOAB was actually issued in error as opposed to uh, uh, because it did not involve her particular workstation. It should have involved the workstation for Mr. Uh, Bogart, who also occupies the premises. Okay. I mean, and he's also the owner of the establishment that's shown on the proof of inspection. And he's also a bar. But there were, from my understanding, there were violations that related directly to Ms. Moses. I, I, according to uh, my information, based on the proof of inspection that I have that was actually given by Mrs. Lindsay at the time, I don't think any of the uh, allegations or violations specifically referred to anything re regarding to Mrs. Moses. Failing to use disinfectant in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendation and then she did not change the disinfectant data. That's, that's the violation. Well, actually, I am looking at the proof of inspection that was actually uh, left at the premises. Right. Okay, but that's that's the violation that she has against her. And again, based on her understanding of how this works, Mrs. Moses has practiced as a barber for 25 years, and as you can see, she's never had a problem in this regard. So she mistakenly misunderstood that this proof of inspection, okay, was not necessarily <laughs> something that did not apply to her. She believed that the proof of inspection only applied to Mr. Bogart, and she wanted, and she do believe that she had a defense to the allegations. So there, therefore, the motion for rehearing is urged in order for her to proffer that defense in, in, in regard to allegations that appear to be against her. So back to you, sir. What what are you trying to achieve with the rehearing? I mean, I'm I'm not very clear on on where you're going with this because the he has been assessed, the inspection was performed. Uh, admittedly, Ms. Moses has uh, admitted the fact that the disinfectant wasn't there. So what are you trying to achieve? It's not Mrs. Moses. It is my understanding that Mrs. Moses did not admit that, this, that the disinfectant, as it relates to her, was a problem. In fact, <coughs> um, I, I, I understand we're not here to get into the facts of the case as far as the inspection. But it's my understanding that it was indicated at the time to the inspector that her disinfectant was changed. But that, but also Mr. Bogart had dis, dis, disinfected. He was uh, dis, disinfected, and that disinfectant is probably the disinfectant that that is referred to on the proof of inspection. Della, can you help me with that? What what are we trying to get in here? I mean, what? Well, what basically, is, I'm just uh, in a nutshell. It's a default. We send the notice out, the presumption if we send it to the correct address that it's received, that is a person's opportunity to argue. Was it returned? It was unclaimed. Okay. Uh, to the Cosby Street address, which is the only address we use. <clears throat> and the presumption is it's received um, at the correct address, whether or not it was unclaimed is not, you know, we have a rule basically that says failure to claim it doesn't mean it didn't get there. And the way it, the default works is the facts as pled are taken as true unless she asks for a hearing or something like that. She didn't. Uh, it's pretty clear in the NOAB that it was referring to her workstation. Whether or not she may have signed off or had some involvement with the inspection, I don't know. There may be some confusion about how she's involved in it, but this <coughs> looks like it's clearly her workstation and not Mr. Bo Bogardo's. So the, all the elements to me are here. We sent it to the correct address. She had an opportunity to challenge it, to ask for a hearing, and chose not to. So we, we see no error here. And I appreciate that follow-up. So my question back to you, sir, is, again, I, I ask, what are you trying to achieve through this rehearing? Because you've already been assessed a $500 penalty. My concern for you is, should you be granted this rehearing, Commission could come back in and assess a higher fee. That is my concern for you. So just just something to consider. Sure, but it is my understanding that she does have a viable defense to to that allegation. She's trying to rehear this again. Mrs. Moses has been a barber for over 25 years. She's never had a violation, and she certainly is trying to maintain a stellar record as it relates to her being barber. Okay. Any other questions, Thank you. Mr. Lewis? Thank you. 
Well, I guess the, you know, way you said it's not claimed, is there any reason why it wasn't claimed? I'm not aware of any reason why it was, uh, or are you referring to the final uh, order or the NOAB? Um, the NOAB. Why was the NOAB. Why was it? Okay, when the notice was sent regarding the violations, why was it? Was there any reason why it was it's my understanding the notice regarding the violation of uh, regarding the NOAB was sent to a home address as opposed to the address for the shop. Her home address is the 3910 Cosby address as, as opposed to the shop address, which is 2301 Cleaver. It's put on her license already registered at her home or at shop. Sure. It should be. Uh, uh, it's her understanding that it's based at the shop, yeah. which would be the 2301. Did we send anything to the 2301 or into her home address? Do we have record of that? I don't know. I know that the Cosby Street address is the only address we ever so use, and I know that's her mailing address that she indicated to us at the time that the NYP was sent. And, and again, and I understand what I don't have direct proof on is that Mrs. Moses did call, you know, after, it's not like she stood by and did nothing after she received the interview. And I will, may I interrupt? There's nothing in the motion for rehearing about anybody calling. I will remind you that the law effective 9-1 of this year basically says that if it's not pled or stated in the motion for rehearing, it cannot be considered by you today. So if I can ask staff um, on the uh, penalty that's been assessed at $500, would I be correct in saying that that is the minimum penalty in our matrix? I believe that's fair to say that that's the first time it thinks and that one penalty, Christine, I'm kind of looking at you, Mr. Diamond. I don't know which class it is. It's a class D violation. Uh, for the disinfectant and according to the NOAB first time class D um, is 500 okay. it's, it's a flat there's no real range yeah yeah no, thank you again I'm going back to the question that I'd asked earlier and to you sir and mrs. Moses uh, I'm not sure what we're going to get out of the rehearing unless, uh, other than maybe discussing the merits of the inspection, which appear to be very clear in the default order. I'm, I'm struggling again with this with this very case about the rehearing. You, you've been assessed a penalty, and I believe it is, a, it is the lowest uh, fine that there is. Uh, it was very obvious from the inspection that you can see that the disinfectant wasn't there and so i'm not quite sure where, what we're going to achieve in, in the rehearing unless somebody on the commission can help me understand what we're going to achieve from the rehearing can, can i respond again Please. the disinfectant was there it is there and again the purpose for the rehearing would be to proper a viable defense to that allegation because the disinfectant is there it was there on the date of the inspection I, and again, without getting into the facts of the inspection, I do believe that this, this uh, uh, inspection was primarily the, an inspection that involved a station other than Mrs. Moses' station. And therefore, and again, uh, therefore, uh, uh, the, the things that's reflected on this uh, inspection, even though Mrs. Moses signed off on it, it was signed off on by her, not because related to matters that's played in the motion for me here and that, that I filed. Mr. Chairman, can I give you some clarity on cosmetology licenses? Uh, the cosmetology license is a um, transportable license. It's not tied to a shop in the database because the cosmetologist go between different shops so often that we've been constantly updating addresses on that. So a cosmetology operator license is key to the individual's address, home address, not to a shop address. So 
there should be no confusion back and forth whether I was at the shop and didn't get it there or whether I was at home and didn't get it there. It goes to the home address that's on record with, with, with the agency. But, okay, and I guess in this case, where, did we say that the NOVP in this case went to the shop? It went to the address that we have a record, oh, right, right. which may record. be her home, I don't know, oh, but no. it is uh, on Cosby Street. Yeah, the Cosby address is her home address. 3910 Cosby. 3910 Cosby, and then if you look at the proof of the inspection, the shop address is 2301 Cleaver. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, um, again, I'm, this is not a motion, but just, just something that I think I'm, I normally don't struggle with, Jason, but for some reason, uh, this last, I think, it was, one of those days. I think it was that coffee that did it, I think, this morning, but I think these two cases I'm just struggling with, with, with understanding and putting my arms around this whole address issue, which I probably need to do a better job of learning how the commission, I mean, I mean, how the agency does their addressing. Um, but, but in this particular case, I think that, again, just for grins, I think this may be uh, in order for the commission to uh, rehear the case. Why? Um, I'm just struggling with, with the fact about the disinfectant that wasn't there, there, there and I'm hearing that it was there. Um, do you see error on our part? Again, I'm confused about the address. I'm just yeah. confused about where the address Mr. is. Mr. Saul, that, that's, that's appropriate enough for you. If, if that's what you see, yeah. then that's sufficient enough. I'll support that. I'll support that. I would call you out support that. And then, I, because I think it, in every case, it's, we have done a result of settling these cases and getting them behind us. This has an opportunity for us to have dialogue. It's unfortunate to have dialogue. And then since this is a default, it was never heard. Let's give them a chance to do that. And then, and then you know it. Uh, you better get, you know, you have to, you have to follow through. If you don't, no, good things don't happen. If you don't. But you must follow through. So I'm going to. Yeah, the question was asked as to why, and I'll, and I'll see if I can be a little more specific. And I don't need to do this. I understand that. But I, I think I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with the, when a licensee is at not at their particular station or they claim that that's particular, it's not their particular station, is our enforcement verifying that that is not their particular station? And then is the, is the citation or the NOV, the NOV then sent to that particular individual whose station is not or whoever's there at that, at that shop that's signing off on that inspection? I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that, so. Well, and um, why I, I completely respect Mr. Shaw. I think in this particular case, we're deviating from uh, what this motion for rehearing is. The NOAB was sent to 3910 Cosby Street. It was unclaimed, but it was still delivered. Well, it wasn't delivered, it was unclaimed. It was unclaimed. But we did but it was, mail it, it was to the correct address. Yeah, it was mailed <coughs> to the address of record. Uh, was the final order claimed? Do we have that? I assume so because she filed the motion for rehearing. But so, so we did get a final order that apparently based on kind of a uh, deduction of reason that it was uh, claimed because it was a, a motion for rehearing file. And it was sent to Cosby Street as well. And it was also sent to the Cosby Street. So going back to the purpose of a motion for rehearing, I don't see where the commission erred in any way uh, getting this information to Ms. Moses. Uh, so while I understand that Mr. Shaw is struggling with the facts of the case, I don't think that's the purpose of this motion for rehearing. The commission did not err. Where we received a final order, but we did not receive it. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Commissioner Sir, Sunquist, um, at the time of inspection, uh, is, is are the licensees left with a, a document of any kind uh, that addresses the violation? I believe so. Okay. Okay. So, Commissioner, with the added information, uh, let me ask this question: 
in 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 our in our package, we have a notice of a late violation. It looks like the staff at TDLR had negotiated or has been working with the applicant on a reduced penalty of three hundred seventy-five dollars. Is that correct? Am I reading that correct? On the NOAB? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, normally the NOAB does offer a reduced penalty if there is a settlement. Uh, but according to the order, she didn't claim the NOAB, so there was, she didn't do anything. So she had the opportunity to do that. Does she still have the opportunity to do that now? In my opinion, this is not the appropriate time to do that. I'll leave that up to the body to see what you want to do with this. Well, if it goes back to enforcement, they could, they could try and resolve this. If you grant the motion for rehearing, effectively it vacates this the default order. Um, enforcement will probably start over with another NOAD. So. Which we could end up being in the same place again. I'm hearing you say that. If it's a default, perhaps, or if you go to SOA, if there's a this Mrs. Moses has, again, and, and again, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but the, according to the uh, Commissioner Butler's question, the only thing that was left was the copy of the proof of inspection at the time that the inspection occurred. But in all fairness, we don't know because we don't have that all that inspection in front of us. Well, it's part of the Commission's file. No, that part is not. We only Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's part of the. the, the, the Brett, on the general council, I think we're problem. getting into the merits of the case. Yeah, sure. And that would only happen. Sure. That that would be the purpose of the hearing, or to question or to grant, or that motion for report Any true. further questions for other Ms. Lakers or Mr. Lewis? No. I believe that we got the grant motion for I'll go ahead and second that motion for discussion. We have a motion and a second to grant motion for hearing any further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. No opposed? No. no. Uh, okay, from my take the roll again. Tom Butler? No. Luann Morgan? Aye. Fred Moses? Aye. Catherine Rogold? Aye. Robbie Shaw? Aye. Deborah Yurko? No. Mike Garris Mendez? No. <coughs> Motion carries four to three. Staff will be in contact with you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis, for being here. Not related to Commissioner Lewis. I'm not putting that back <laughs> on the record. <laughs> yeah, my hair stood up on the back of my head when I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's move on to. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Ray. What year was at the time? <laughs> 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 I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. You're still under oath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to see, it's but it's, it is there. Thank you. Marlena Luna, Hot Nuts Barber. Is anyone here representing uh, Hot Nuts Barber or Marlena Luna? This one too. Okay, uh, this is also a default order, and the motion, her motion for rehearing basically alleges confusion uh, because there were basically two different NOABs for two different inspections that, that went to her at approximately the same time. I believe she acted on one and ignored the other, uh, which would be this one. Uh, we agree that the NOABs went out relatively close in time. Uh, regarding the same two unlicensed people in the shop. We would remind you that from the time of the first inspection to the time of the second one, they still hadn't gotten a license. So uh, there's no error on the part of the department, even though these inspections were relatively close in time. Ultimately, the two people apparently did get licensed. So her, her only allegation of error is just her own confusion. I see no error and recommend denying the motion for rehearing. I move to grant the motion for rehearing and then ultimately dismiss the action of prejudice. That's the recommendation from GC. You're now saying that you Yeah, I'm sorry. At the time, uh, I thought we had supplemented this. I'm, I very much apologize. I can see the confusion that the person may have had, but we see no error on the part of the department. Uh, so there, you weigh that, but we mail them to the correct address 
and I will reiterate that. This is not an address issue. No, no. Um, she doesn't acknowledge she didn't get anything. She acknowledges that she believed they were kind of all the same case because they were pretty close in time and they involved having two unlicensed people working for her. The inspections were about a week apart. So she, she basically responded to one and, and the second one she did not respond to because she thought it was the same one. That's what she's first. saying. Yes. But we actually had two different cases going on. Two different cases going on okay. and I will reiterate that even at the second, by the time they came back and did the second inspection a week later, a different inspector, they were still unlicensed, which shows that she, they didn't act real fast even after the first inspection. So I apologize. I believe I had thought I had supplemented my recommendation to you, and I do recommend that I don't see any error and that we deny the motion for the hearing. While acknowledging the confusion, but I don't see any error. And okay, well, on this particular case, how do you recommend that? Any further discussion or questions for Ms. Linkus? Commissioner Shaw. Uh, I'll make a motion to deny uh, the motion for repairing. Uh, second motion. that motion. And a second by Commissioner Butler. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Uh, item number 4, uh, both of you know. So we're also going to make your brain yeah. have to work some, but. Um, this gentleman apparently did attempt to enter into a settlement agreement with the department and uh, sent in a letter saying that he really couldn't pay what the settlement was. Ultimately, he did pay the settlement amount, but it was after the executive director had already signed the default order. Again, there's no error on the part of the department. Um, but but what's he has it? paid 750 He has paid. So there, you have several options. Um, again, we recommend there was no error, but he did pay. So there's some things to consider. Um, his letter did say, did inform the department that he wasn't going to be able to pay that much. And um, we, we may not have acted on that information. Um, but has he paid the full amount? He's paid $750 which was the settlement amount that's in the NOAB when it first comes to, the, to, to respondents. And he apparently wanted to do that. He told us that um, back in April that that was still too much. Um, but then as far as I know, nothing happened on that. So he did send in ultimately that $750, but it was after the notice of the fall had gone out and after the executive director had signed the order. I'm ready to make a motion of this one, too. So there's kind of three options laid out for you there. Mr. Shaw. Sure. And I apologize, Commissioner, for delivering the other two cases. Uh, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion to deny the motion for hearing and modify the order to reduce the total penalty of 750. Okay, motion. I'll second that motion. And, and second. Yes, sir. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those right, opposed? Motion carries. So no. Item number five, uh, Jose Corrales. I believe you have something here for what? Karen Case. All right. And I believe after the last few that we've had, you understand we've only been talking about where we are. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. And that's where we want to focus. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, uh, Ms. Lynch, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Corrales, uh, this is also a default order. It was not alleged. Um, it was alleged some confusion about his address. However, the address of record was the Burleson address. It was alleged in the motion for rehearing that it was not received until August 29th, but I think that might have been the order that you're talking about. Um, but anyway, it, it appears that he received the notice of NOAB to the correct address. Um, and he has paid, let's see, the remaining balance of what he owed. This case was going to be a revocation of his license for failure to pay a you know, previous penalty. He has since paid it. We see no error in what the department did. We sent it to the correct address. However, to be in keeping with precedent that you have done before, we would recommend um, denying the motion for a rehearing that you can probate the revocation for one year conditioned on compliance with 
that he's in the because he has paid it before. Any questions from the I'm going to The probating would allow him to continue work. Okay. Uh, what you're talking about, we do have Ms. Cable for uh, Ms. Cable, you can, if you don't mind, state your name for the record, but understand that what she's saying is that we deny it, but probate it. If I could just have, a, let me introduce myself. I'm Karen Cagle. I'm the attorney for Fort Worth representing Mr. Jose Perales in this motion for reconsideration. Um, Would you like to the, with them? Just briefly. Sure, go right ahead. Yeah, just turn it away. We uh, would accept their probation okay. offer that would be. Mr. a motion to be Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and make a motion if there's no, no questions. Um, I'm going to make a motion to deny the rehearing uh, and probate the revocation for one year condition on the compliance of state statute rules. Uh, okay. We'll and we have a motion accept. on the floor. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So if you're good to go, staff will give it to you, but yes. Uh, so you can come, you can come, you can come to me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank y'all very much. Uh, let's go on to item six. Uh, in the text. <coughs> Again, this is an issue of a default order where the respondent has ultimately paid the remaining balance. Um, and we recommend denying the motion for rehearing but probating the revocation for one year. Anyone here for Roger? Take a motion to deny the rehearing, probate the revocation for one year, consistent with our case that was. Similar uh, last case and subject to compliance with laws and rules set by the statute. We have a motion on the floor. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by the same nine. Aye. 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 Motion carries seven. Uh, item number seven. Uh, item number seven. Let's go with that. Ms. Warren, at the time, uh, had not entered into a repayment agreement with us. She has, and she's current on the repayment agreement. Um, we see no error. We would recommend denying the motion for a hearing, but also uh, probating the, uh, the revocation. Anyone here for this warrant? Commissioner's a motion? Go ahead. So we need that the council motion. We have a motion? <laughs> to, to deny the, the motion. The hearing and probate. Yeah. The motion on floor? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Both opposed, motion carried. Item number eight, passion four. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, General counsel sees no error <coughs> here. It was also a default order. Uh, we were to be sent the NOAB to the LLC's registered agent, and it was delivered on February 11th, 2015. We recommend denying the motion for rehearing. Anyone here for passion four? Motion, uh, motion be ordered. So, uh, we have a motion. I'll second that. All in favor, <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Item number nine, extra county ISD. <coughs> this motion for a hearing was filed by Otis Elevator, apparently on behalf of Hector County, who is the owner of the elevator. And we recommend denying the motion for a hearing. The motion for a hearing appears to allege the fact that Hector County contacted Otis to try to get all of this done, but it's really the responsibility of Hector County to have had the inspection done, uh, and they didn't. Uh, so we recommend denying the motion for a hearing. Before we proceed forward, Commissioner uh, Morgan has informed me she will recuse herself from this. Conflict of interest. Though. Conflict of interest, uh, as if they are a client. Though. So she's going to recuse herself from discussion. Is the recess uh, the, uh, the ISD has not they've not they've been in touch with us and they have not they've tried to resolve this. 
Apparently, for years, Exeter County ISD has had inspections done. They missed one. And over there's a, you'll see in the motion for rehearing, there's a series of emails between Exeter County and Otis Elevator, who does maintenance for trying to get them under some kind of maintenance agreement. Meanwhile, time goes by. Exeter County knew or should have known that it's their responsibility to get the inspection done and not sort of drop it in Otis Elevator's lap. And Otis filed the motion for a hearing, really on behalf of Exeter County, which is strange, but um, it's still the responsibility. It's the responsibility of the owner of the elevator. Can I ask you about the administrative penalty of two thousand dollars? Where does that fall within the range? Um, I can look at the NOAA. Normally, the default would be the high end. Sure, but I just wondered. And you said they they had multiple inspections in the past. This is just a, a current one that they brought. That was alleged in the motion for a hearing. This was a according to the motion for to the NOAB, which is what we're dealing with today. It was inspected in 2013 and had not had a 2014 inspection. So it's a Class C violation. And the class C would be from 1,000 to 3,000 per unit, uh, plus getting the inspection done. So 2,000 is in the middle. The, the thing I you know, might be concerned about is this uh, chart you know, the county of uh, uh, taxing authority. Uh, and, and then assuming that they knew, I think we should need to communicate with them before we do it. I, I would, I would Really communicate with the county and say, "Hey, this is the highest That's what I would, I would, I would support. Okay. Can I ask if you, uh, I, my concern though is the county huh? does have a responsibility. ISD. ISD has a responsibility to their students and the people in the building, and I hate to see it set an example that they can just walk away from it. But it pains me to think to have that taxing authority get fined so high, and I. I would like but I, but to make a motion to do a nominal penalty to show that they were wrong and they need to stay up on it because they do have responsibility. Well, I, I don't wrong. think we should be changed, assuming that they do okay. and that what, what they need to be done. So I think know, we need to communicate with them. I so the nominal penalty would be 500? Because you've made a motion. I'm just right, that's what I'm saying. So I'm you're making a motion to basically deny? Deny the, the hearing, but to amend the penalty to 500. That's so hopefully they'll, because I mean, I understand what you're saying, the communication. I think they got the communication by getting the demand. Well, I, don't, I think we'd make an assumption that they knew. I think we need to tell them. I well, think we, need well to we have a motion on the floor. Okay. Is that a second one? What is the motion? The motion, the motion is, is to deny the motion for rehearing, but to amend the penalty to $500 from 2000 Because I think the point will get across to the independent school district rather than taking the money out of their budget but I don't feel like you can just walk away from this because it is an important responsibility. So we have a motion on the floor. I'll second. And a second discussion. Um, I share the same same viewpoints as uh, Commissioner Yoko. Um, but I do have, I am struggling a little bit with the reduction in the fine or in the penalty. So give me a moment to kind of put my arms around that also. I don't believe that a texting entity versus a private entity, I don't see the difference between the two when it comes to elevator safety. Elevator safety should be everyone's business, especially when you've got a building that's housed with an elevator. So I'm struggling with the, with the reduction in penalties, so just bear with me for a second. And there's no doubt that she, they received it. They just bounced this stuff to Otis. Otis is trying to admit it was their fault, that it was not their responsibility. And in the past, you stated that they have had the inspections and have not had any problems with it, except this case here. That's what was alleged in the motion for here. Um. Any further questions? No further. No further questions, but just, just a comment. If, if, if we proceed with this, are we setting a precedence for uh, future future re-hearings that deal with elevator safety and elevator inspections? I'm just posing that as a, as a point of discussion. 
You would be. Did we say <coughs> that the warranty range was between a thousand and three thousand? And so two thousand is down the middle. For for this case, for the yeah. class C. Right. Okay. Uh, would the But you're you're not bound by the penalty maker. Sure. But would the motion maker accept the friendly amendment of a thousand? Yeah, I yeah, I just I mean you're taking it from the budget of that independent school district. I understand that, but it's still a uh, a cost that uh, for safety uh, either way and it, it falls within a penalty matrix of a thousand. Would you accept sure. that as a friendly amendment? Sure. So the motion is now to deny the motion for a year but amend the penalty of a thousand. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. 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 Uh, Ms. Kay, would you please uh, take the roll? Excuse me, Tom Butler? No. Lillian Morgan? Uh, I, uh, oh, sorry. She's, sorry. She's <laughs> Fred Moses? No. Catherine Rodewald? No. Robbie Shaw? Yes. Deborah Yurko? Yes. Mike Harris Mendez? Yes. 3 3. I'm going to take my second. We'll discuss it. Okay, then we don't have a second. Oh, on, the on the amendment? Yeah, because it's Okay, so let's go back. The motion is now, and, uh, and I apologize, I thought I heard a second ago. So the motion is actually to deny the $500. Correct. Okay, so if that's the motion to be $1,000, we go. So we'll go back to the $500. Right. Right. So let's go ahead and move along. Is there a second for that motion? Yes. The second, second on the $500. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 So right now you're okay. doing Yeah, what happened was that we didn't have a, so, a second on the amended okay. uh, uh, penalty amount of a thousand. And I, and I, my apologies, I thought I heard the second. I, so I think, um, I think we'd send a message either way. Um, and I think if a school district can get off the hook uh, and just pay 25% of what the original penalty was going to be, I think it sends a message to their school board, we've got to take this stuff seriously. Uh, because when that shows up as a line item for $2,000, you say, what the heck is this and why? I understand that it's a school district, uh, and that's our tax money in the end, but for there to be accountability uh, to their school board, uh, for the employees that are concerned with the safety aspects of, of uh, these buildings, and the children or administrators or teachers can go in and out of them, um, I think it sends the kind of message we want to send that there's going to be a penalty. Uh, so I, I voted against it because I thought it was too low. You're in favor of the 2000. Are you saying he agreed? Go ahead. So we have a, any further discussion? So we yes, don't. there is. Yes. Um, again, going back, I think we're, we're not struggling with the motion for rehearing. I think we're struggling with the penalty. So that's what it seems like. So let me pose another scenario for the commission to consider. Um, this is a public school. It's an ISD. Tomorrow you may have an elevator for a private charter school or another church school or something else. Would we be willing to go in there and reduce the penalty fee as well? So that's something to consider. Again, I, I go back to the life safety of, of of the children, the the occupants of that building, and again, being the commission that we are, I think we should look at it more, more on an equitable basis. Regardless of what entity it is, what taxing structure they have, what financial bearings they have, that should not be our concern at at large. So, and and I I agree with you. I think that uh, I only I only offered a, a thousand dollar amended motion to simply push this conversation forward. I'm with Commissioner Butler that I believe two thousand dollars is sufficient, and I was willing to support the thousand uh, dollar penalty as well. I mean, that's you know numbers is one versus two and two versus one. So 
a $500 looking at the previous cases that we had where we had assessed $500 for some other item. I think for me, this is much more of a safety issue and sending that message would be the appropriate thing. Can I ask a question? Sure. Because I'm listening to the comments and either way we're going to have a tie vote here no matter what because I don't think anyone's going to move on whether it's the amount of penalty or no penalty or the full penalty. So what happens when we're at a stomach? You've got a full board here. Yeah. And we're going to have an even, I think we're going to end up having a 3-3 split no matter what on this thing. It would be a no vote and then what would happen is the motion for rehearing would be denied by operation of law in a few more weeks. Okay. Unless we continued it to another day. If you got it. Right. Yeah, everybody here. I agree. We'd have to wait for you to take vacation again. Then they can appeal it to district court. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They could appeal. That's correct. So basically what that means to Brother Sands is if we can't make a decision here, it's going to be denied and go to a $2,000 fee. Right. And they can find a district court. So, Mr. Chairman, if I can plead back to the motion maker to maybe reconsider the motion and maybe ask for a second which I would be willing to do that if the motion maker agrees to going back to the motion, denying the rehearing and assessing a $1,000 penalty. Let's try that motion again. Based on the discussion. How about if I just take back my motion and somebody else can make it? So you're withdrawing your motion? I'll withdraw my motion. So the motion has been withdrawn. But on the 500? Yeah. I'm just going to withdraw my motion. So we'll now entertain a new motion. Commissioner Shaw. All right. I'll be ready to make the motion. I'm going to make the motion to deny the rehearing and reduce the penalty from $2,000 to $1,000 as suggested by the chair. And basing that motion on the discussion that we just had recently. And then I'll wait for a second. I'll second that motion. Do we have a motion to second any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Ms. Smehan, could you please call the roll? Tom Butler? Aye. Fred Moses? No. Catherine Rodewald? Aye. Rocky Shaw? Aye. Deborah Yurko? Aye. Mike Pierce Mendez? Aye. Motion carries 5-1. Let's go ahead and take a break. It is 10-10. Let's take a break for about 10-25. And at this point, we'll take up beginning with item P. We'll go ahead and bring the meetings back to order. And for purposes of trying to get through all this rules and everything, I want to ask that we come up and get straight to the point because I will have some commissioners leaving in approximately about an hour. I want to have them back. So we want to make sure we get to the point. Let's go ahead and make agenda J, which is discussion of possible action to revise the motion. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. I'm Christina Kaiser, director of the Enforcement Division. At agenda item J, you have an updated version of our penalty matrix for the electricians program. We have all had a discussion recently about another penalty matrix, so I'll dispense with the introductory information that I normally give. This penalty matrix was last published in April of 2007. The biggest reason why we needed to update it and bring it to you today is to bring the violations and citations in line with the current statute and rules. The statute has been amended every legislative session since this matrix was last published. That was five legislative sessions. Surprisingly, those statute changes really did not have much impact on the penalty matrix because the statute does not contain a large number of detailed provisions that actually give rise to violations. The statute more sets out the broad fundamentals like the requirement to hold a license and the requirement to do work according to code. The most significant changes to the statute through all those five years worth of changes or five sessions were to add new license types to this program. For example, in 2007, statute changes added the residential appliance installers and contractors, and then in 2013, another statute change added the journeyman linemen. 
uh, when those license types were added, however, the legislature did not add new or unique um, obligations or standards of conduct. So no great impact on the matrix from the statute changes. The rules are another matter. Since this matrix was last pub published, the rules have been amended nine times. Out of those nine rounds of rule changes, two had the most significant impact on this matrix. Those that were effective in de on December 1st, 2007 and January 1st, 2010. Both of these rounds of rule changes um, added additional obligations for contractors, for the various types of contractors under the statute. Obligations like maintaining records of work performed and making those available to the department. Uh, the responsibility to supervise licensees that are performing work on behalf of the contractor. Uh, the obligation to perform safe and proper installation and service uh, and to ensure the, the electromechanical integrity of all work performed. I will be happy to answer questions um, as we go along about when the new provisions were added to the statute or the rules if you are inclined to ask those questions, but I, I won't spend a lot of time on that now um, in the interest of brevity. In addition to the statute and rule updates, uh, we also made some other changes to the matrix. We changed some of the language to clarify the way some of the, the violations were described. We added a few violations that have actually been in the law, the law for a really long time but were left out of the last version of the matrix. Uh, we added subject matter headings within each class uh, to make it easier to find a particular violation. You may recall we've added those in some of the other penalty matrices that we've revised over the last few years and they've been well received by the industry. We moved a few violations around in this matrix, and I'll touch on those, and we uh, added an option for a penalty in Class D, the highest class, to be consistent with changes that we've made to other matrices. Ultimately, at the end of the day today, I'll be asking you to uh, recommend, or, or asking you to approve this penalty matrix uh, to be published as part of the agency's enforcement plan. I can walk through the changes that have happened in the matrix if you would like, or I can uh, leave that open to questions. What would be your, your preference? Commissioners, what's your preference on this? Do you want to go through each one or just hit the highlights? Or have you noticed anything that's kind of brought uh, to your attention mm -hmm. or consternation on your part? I would say as long as the advisory board didn't like to like they, they review these, they're, they're all yeah, my apologies, commissioners. I failed to mention we did present this matrix to the electrician's advisory board on October 6th of this year, and they recommended that you approve it. Questions? I move that if you approve that reference. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the penalty matrix for the electricians. Mr. Chairman, will this be posted on the website? Yes. Yes. yes it, will. It, it is published in the Texas Register as a procedure of the agency and it's also posted on the website. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to item K, which is the uh, update on the uh, contingency letter. So I don't know if this Bill's got that or Brian's got that contingency plan? Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Coons, the executive director. The, um, we're still waiting for movement from the uh, comptroller's office on the certification. The uh, current situation is that the comptroller's office has indicated that they are waiting for the legislative budget board to uh, give direction to them on uh, amending the language in the rider. Uh, it's been a back and forth situation. Uh, we met with the uh, uh, clerk for the uh, Senate Finance Committee. Uh, they've been in discussions with the Legislative Budget Board and with the uh, Comptroller's Office. Uh, we're looking to possibly get a partial release or partial certification of the uh, appropriation, but that's still up in the air at this point in time. So, uh, the. It seems like we're moving toward a resolution on this, but it's moving rather slowly. Uh, the one thing that we've informed uh, all of the parties about is that, that 
of the uh, timeline that we distributed at the last commission meeting that there's a seven month delay from the time that we get the appropriation to when we can finally do the uh, final absorption of the new programs because we have to go through <coughs> bidding for the computer uh, programs, the software, and then uh, implementing that and bringing uh, those programs across. And, and uh, so it, there's a, a, a delay before we can just turn it on. It's uh, during that uh, seven month period, we would be hiring to bring people in, but uh, the final transfer of the, the program and, and our assumption of all of those duties would be seven months after we finally get the certification of the appropriation from the comptroller. So uh, we'll continue working on this. Uh, I think that uh, more and more people have been involved in, in saying we need to get this straightened out. Uh, I think that as a few more uh, key legislative people uh, become uh, involved in it, the sooner that we'll get the, uh, the, the final certification. Right. Uh, Brian reminded me, we've also uh, been working with the governor's office. We've informed them about it, and they, they've gone to talk to the uh, uh, comptroller about these issues so that uh, that, that's part of what I was alluding to, that the more uh, the uh, officials that become involved with this, the, uh, I guess the heightened awareness and necessity becomes uh, more, more certain that, uh, that we'll finally get a resolution. Uh, we, I mean, I've described it as TDLR has the high ground on this. We've, we've uh, had a history of being able to uh, implement the transfer of programs quickly and efficiently uh, and this is the first time that we've run into this type of uh, situation and it's not because of something that we did it's the interpretation of language that's in the rider uh, by the staff at the uh, comptroller's office uh, and it's uh, it, we just have to get over that hurdle and for purposes of information also for the uh, uh, commissioners and what are listening the delay that we have in obtaining this uh, revenue uh, delays bringing in the new uh, programs that have been uh, brought to us after this last session. Uh, but we are, the advisory appointments are still being made. Uh, the rules are still being put out there, and we're going through all that with the advisory boards. Uh, we have run into an issue where boards may have rules set down the Texas Register right now while we're kind of looking and, and, and doing the rules for our agency as it brings that program over to us. So uh, Brian has done a very good job of explaining it to the advisory board, simply saying it's kind of like we have two railroad tracks and we have one railroad track that they're currently on and getting the rules in uh, place and making some changes to it, but we have these other tracks that were laid down, which will be the rule that, that will come over when uh, the program comes over to us officially. Uh, and just advisory board's been very good about getting the rules and doing them in place, but until that revenue work, the revenue can come over, will we actually fully see the implementation of those rules on our side? But we're still moving, moving forward on it, but. Uh, so there's a lot riding on this revenue and getting that over to us. The seven month time frame that we're talking about would be at the point that they actually bring it, that they actually release it and get it to us. It'll be seven months from that that we actually would have full implementation. So uh, there's a lot riding on getting this money uh, over to us. Uh, but uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in contact, of course, with Bill and Brian on this. And I know that they're doing everything that we can. Uh, I was here last week when we met with some staff members uh, of the Senate and the House and trying to get that information, trying to get that monies released. Uh, and I know also the governor's office is working on that. We, we, we completely appreciate that and thank you for that. Um, and so it's just, we got a lot of things happening. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff being done in the background. Uh, we're moving <coughs> forward. It's just whenever we can get that money released, Will we actually have full implementation of these programs? That's a question. Uh, Bill, I knew, I knew um, that we were having some trouble with regard to a couple of the uh, agencies that we were taking licenses from. 
uh, Health and Human Services. Um, but is this across all the programs that we're that we're taking taking in this year? Are we having the same funding problems and the slowdown? Driver's education mm -hmm. is transferred. That that part of the appropriations was certified, so we're in good shape on that. Uh, it's the seven uh, programs with Department of State Health Services coming to us. Uh, the uh, staff at the Department of State Health Services have been excellent working with us on the handoff. Uh, there's no problem on that end. Uh, the issue is with the Comptroller's Office to certify the uh, appropriation. Uh, and as I said, we, we keep talking to more and more individuals about this, to, and I guess as the level of awareness or the level of heat goes up, uh, then it, I guess at some point we're going to get to the tipping point where we'll get that taken care of. Uh, the the fail-safe that we have, uh, absolute fail-safe, in January of 2017, uh, the legislature comes back in session. At that point, we could get a supplemental appropriation and get it all taken care of at that point in time. But it would be disastrous to wait that long. I mean, we, uh, we have the ability to operate at a greater level of efficiency than the programs have been operating in a silo basis over at the Department of State Health Services. Uh, We've spent a lot of time uh, getting up ready for that. Uh, we've expended uh, revenue <coughs> for uh, building out the space where the new employees will be, buying the computers that the new employees will be using. So uh, we've fronted those expenses already, and it's just uh, one of those things that the sooner we get things taken care of, the better off everybody's going to be. And also that. Uh, it's imperative that we, that we get this done because, uh, as a reminder, we have additional programs that will be coming to us that we'll be start bringing over next year as a part of the legislation that was passed. The next, next biennium. Right. So the next biennium. Biennium. And, so and, and I would dare say that for that biennium's transfer, that we'll probably have language in the uh, rider that is absolutely clear and we won't have this problem at that point. And so, uh, but. What uh, I guess my concern is to have all these begin to start stacking on top of each other in the implementation process because what have the, what, whenever we get the money, <coughs> if they roll over to the next biennium or seven months after that, then we got these new programs that'll be starting up again. So they could start stacking and start causing uh, a lot more work than what our staff currently is, is doing right now trying to get these going. But uh, so I mean, there are some other things that begin to start bumping into each other and we begin to start looking at it from that angle. So. But uh, I can tell you that uh, working with staff on this and, and bringing the uh, transition of these programs over, uh, they know what they're doing. And so it's been uh, very encouraging because they're, they're troopers in doing this work because we had an 11-hour meeting Monday and then an 8-hour meeting, 7-hour meeting yesterday. So, uh, But we're getting a lot of good feedback from everybody. So, any questions for Bill? Thank you, Bill. Uh, let's go into item K. I'm sorry, that was K. Uh, let's start at item L, the uh, proposed rules for the uh, military veterans. Good morning, William Hello, Assistant General Counsel, section item L. Um, and again, this is uh, related to the proposed amendments to existing rules, uh, proposed new rules, and proposed repeal of existing rules under our Chapter 60 rules related to the licensing of military service members, military veterans, and military spouses. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to call your attention. Uh, Pauline had handed out a one-page document earlier. Um, it's rules with a strike through. I'll get to that in a moment. Just want to make sure you have that in front of you. Um, the proposed uh, rules are necessary to implement the changes that the legislature made this last year uh, to Chapter 55 of the Occupations Code relating to occupational licensing of military members, <coughs> veterans, and spouses. Um, specifically, the changes were made by that affected this proposal were four bills, Senate Bill 807, Senate Bill 1296, Senate Bill 1307, and House Bill 3742. Uh, Basically, that they've made it some, a lot of cleanup changes to that statute, um, extended provisions that just apply to certain military members, expanded that to um, all active duty service members, uh, certain provisions that, that just apply to spouses, 
were expanded to include um, active duty military members and veterans. Um, there are provisions that just apply to spouses of active duty members in the U.S. Armed Forces. Those were uh, expanded to um, apply to spouses of all military members. So they did some cleanup, making things a little bit more unified. Um, one of the other bills um, made some provisions to waive initial application fees and exam fees that were paid to the department. Um, there were certain certain uh, circumstances that were specified in the law. So the proposed rules that are in front of you implement those changes. Um, you have the rules and the summary, so in the interest of time, I won't go through those specifics, but you do have that in front of you. Uh, the proposed rules were published in the Texas Register on September 25th for public comment, and the comment period closed on October 26th of 2015. Uh, the department received four public comments during that um, time period. Uh, you have copies of those uh, public comments and materials. Uh, three were favorable and supportive of the proposed rules. Um, there was one that opposed the adoption um, of the proposed rules. Uh, we did appreciate the comments, but we did not make any changes based on those um, public comments. That being said, we do need to offer an amendment today, an amendment to those proposed rules, and it's specifically rule section 60.35, and it's the uh, determination, um, determining the amount of experience, service, training, and education on your one-page handout that's right there in the middle of your page. Uh, the preamble for the proposed rules explained that we were making a technical correction to consolidate the provisions um, that are in A2 and A3 into one provision so we didn't have spouses listed on one line and, and one provision and then the next subsection uh, with military members and veterans. The purpose was to consolidate that into the uh, military service members, military veterans and spouses. Um, and that was what the preamble explained, but the rule text uh, did not end up consolidating them into three sections. It ended up striking A2, which was the spouses, but didn't end up adding the spouses um, into the new A2, which was with the military service members and veterans. So we would like for the commission to consider an amendment to those proposed rules. The one that's in front of you today um, is part of your consideration of those Chapter 60 rules. And what that will end up looking like is under 60.35 A2, it will read, uh, this section is applicable for applicants who are military service members, comma, military veterans, comma, or military spouses, and who are applying for a license under subchapter K. <coughs> and so I'm happy to answer any questions about the proposed rules or the amendment. I just laid out. Any questions for Lindy? <coughs> and this is effective January 1? Right, we, we, right, <coughs> that's because of the bills in terms of when it applies for applicants to apply on or after January 1st, 2016. So our recommendation would be to adopt the proposed rules with the amendment um, that I just discussed to section 60.35A2, <coughs> the effective date of January 1st, 2016. Commissioner Senate, receive a motion. So moved. Second. The motion is second. All the favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Good work, uh, I man. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item M. Good morning. Number 10, Assistant General Counsel. This is uh, an item for the discussion and possible action on the proposed amendments to the existing rules at 16 Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 66. Specifically, 6680 to implement the changes by House Bill 7 regarding the registration of property tax consultants. The proposed amendment at 6680 removes the $200 original registration and renewal fee for property tax consultants, senior property tax consultants, and real estate property tax consultants. The proposed rules were published in the Texas Register on September 18, 2015. The comment period closed on October 19, 2015. We did not receive any comment in relation to the rule publication. The department uh, recommends that you adopt the rule proposal with an effective date of January 1st, 2016. Any questions for me? Motion will be on it. So moved. Second. A motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Item 10, uh, rules on water with numbers. Again, Della Lindquist, a Deputy General Counsel. <coughs> House Bill 930 passed the session, which effectively um, brought a, a 
apprentice program to the water well program. And so primarily that's what that bill was about with some other minor changes regarding um, how to send in the water well log and reporting and things like that. Um, we, I can go over each one with you, but we added in some definitions. Uh, we added in some requirements and, re and for the apprentice and for the uh, unlicensed person, some requirements for that person that, that's not an apprentice but that, that can still assist uh, a licensed driller at the well under direct supervision. The rules were published in the Texas Register on September 18th. The public comment period closed October 19th. We did receive comments from three interested parties. Um, one person said they appreciated and liked the rules. One commenter uh, recommended some technical changes to some of our wording. And a third comment recommended a change in the way that the apprentice program, or that an apprentice would be supervised and be licensed. And instead of just having the CE at the end of the first year, the public commenter had recommended that the apprentice be directly supervised until the CE, the one hour CE, was actually taken. Because that was a substantive change and more of a stringent requirement on the part of the apprentice involved, that would require refiling the rules and open that particular rule up for public comment. So at this time, the department had recommended declining to amend based on that comment if, if the Water Well Advisory Board wants to take that up at a future date, they can. But at this time, we, we would recommend uh, adopting the rules as proposed with the uh, apprentice just having the CE at the end of that first year. I'm, I'm available for any questions. <coughs> January 1st, okay. 2016. Any questions for no. No. Effective date of January 1st, 2016. Very much. And second. I think I have a second before the motion is done. All in favor, signify with say aye. Aye. Item O, change in the barber program. Good morning, Chairman Eris Mendez and Commission members. My name is Pamela Gade and I'm an Assistant General Counsel. I'm going to be uh, running through the highlights of the rule changes for the Barber Program. These were the result of the passage of House Bill 104, which allows services to be provided outside a licensed facility for special events, such as weddings, quinceaneras, proms, etc. Uh, provided the um, licensee books the service through a barbershop. Also, <coughs> House Bill 2717, which removes hair braiding from the barbering regulations. I have uh, each one of these, uh, we've, we've got several sections of the rules where I can go through specifically and show you where we've deleted any reference to hair braiding, hair braiding licenses, hair braiding fees. Uh, or I can sort of give you a meta, meta view of everything. What, what would you prefer? Would, would you like me to go through each one? No, let's no. just go ahead and take All right. All right. Um, the rules were published in the Texas Register on September the 18th of 2015. The public comment period closed October the 19th. The department received one comment during the 30-day public comment period. The commenter noted that in section 82.120, the hair weaving curriculum referenced hair weaving slash braiding skills. And that commenter suggested that the term should be modified to just hair weaving skills with the deletion of braiding skills since hair braiding had been deregulated. Uh, however, the department wants to clarify that this reference to hair braiding is a technique used in hair weaving. So the reference in, this, in the curriculum is not a standalone hair braiding requirement. Therefore, the department does not recommend any change to the proposed rule based upon this comment. The department, there is one uh, minor item that we would like you to consider in adopting these rules. When published in the Texas Re Register, the proposed language in 82.70B1 stated, under responsibilities of individuals, 
and I'm going to quote, is unable to receive the services at a licensed facility because of Ill illness of physical or mental incapacitation. That should actually read because of illness or physical or mental incapacitation. So we would ask that you adopt this rule proposal with the amendment to 82.70B1 uh, with an effective date of January the 1st, 2016. Any questions for Bill? Motion to be on. Motion to second on the same Motion to carry. Thank you, ma'am. Item P. I think you should get for item P also. That would be cosmetology. All right. This would also uh, involve House Bill 104 and House Bill 2717, allowing the services to be provided outside a licensed facility and removing hair braiding from the cosmetology regulations. Again, all of the rules <coughs> that we have listed for you in the executive and document summary uh, detail the changes that have been made based upon these two bills. Hair braider has been removed from, there's no more reference to hair braider in the, um, in the rules. And the licensed facility uh, person can perform cosmetology services outside of one, provided they go get through the school, the, uh, the facility and it is for quinceaneras, weddings, and it must be at the place where the special event is held. The proposed rules were published in the Texas Register on September the 18th, 2015. The public comment period closed October the 19th, 2015. The department received one comment during the 30-day public comment period. The commenter believes the airbrush equipment requirement for schools offering the manicure curriculum is outdated and should be removed. This comment is outside of the current rule proposal. However, the department will review this again at a later date when we do the rule reviews. On November the 2nd, uh, 2015, the Cosmetology Advisory Board met and recommended that the commission adopt the rules as published in the Texas Register. And the department is recommending that you adopt the proposed rules with an effective date of um, January 1st, 2016. I have a question. Yes. You mentioned something about um, when they do services like for a wedding or mm -hmm. near to other event. You said that only at the only at the site of the special event. Yes. That's crazy. Because most special events do not provide a place for that. Yes. That's based that on was the that's not even statute. practical. It's that's legislative. That's based on that's, change of the statute. That's a statutory change. Right. But were was the <coughs> Was the uh, representatives who proposed it, did anyone communicate? Like, that's not even realistic. And I don't think there's unrealistic in all instances. The, uh, I guess the shorthand for this was the bus to bride uh, provision, and I did not want to go to the church and uh, tell the bride that she could not have her hair done in the updo before the, the wedding. But you still are here. It's the exact same problem. Well, that. I mean, he might as well bust a bride because they're not going to be doing no, it at the event. No, we, we brought this to the legislature, and this is the language that uh, came back to us on this. I think that it's workable language for us. How? Because they don't do it at the events. Well, now they can't. No, I mean, no, you don't understand. It's not it's practical. Not possible. It's, there's I, no way. I, there, I, it's I a waste of I effort. But understand this. This is a statutory <coughs> change, and there's really nothing we can do about Thank it. You. This is a statutory change. It's in the statute. We're simply applying it to our rule. Uh, if I can, Commissioner, this is a statutory debt. Yeah. And, and while you're saying that it's not practical, while you're saying that uh, it's, it's not even real. I understand. But it's a statutory yeah. change that's now part of the I mean, you might as well say the only place they can do it is inside the pool underwater. I mean, it's like it's not going to happen. Well, then we can make that suggestion to the legislature yeah. in the next session. At this point in time, this is what we have. And, I'm not, I am not saying that you're not correct. What I'm saying is that this is what we have. But, I, so, I can't Chairman, wait, 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 I mean, time, hey, time out just a minute. I, we brought this issue to the legislature. The legislature gave us some movement in that direction. I can interpret the legislative intent on this and I can use prosecutorial discretion. I'm not going out to bust a bride if it was at the uh, home right before they went to the, the, the church. The, the situation is that we're trying to address that issue that they could not do anything outside of the salon before. And we've got some movement on that. I'm happy that the legislature helped us out with that provision. 
and there may be something that we can look at in the next session to provide us a little bit more but as so you're know, telling me they were more concerned not having that this I, was a hard thing to get this is hard for our legislatures no. to actually pass i'm so confused i think what we're saying is let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good you know this is just a start well, I understand that, but I felt like I kind of got forced to pass something on breeders that's never changed in the, what, three or four years since that, that Louie and I both were very upset about and didn't want to vote, but we were told we had to do it. And then it's like, and now this is happening, and I just feel like, wait, this is not right. I mean, this is just not even real. It, it, it might as well be the same and use the same, you know, discretion. In enforcing it because it's it's no different. So we have ruled to force with the suggested effective date of January one. I move that we adopt the rule. We have motion. <coughs> we have motion on four. Yes. I'll second the motion. A second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. No. Um, now we've got six points. Yeah. So, motion passes. Okay. Uh, let's go on to item Q. We do have some uh, public comment forms, so we will go ahead and present the rule changes, and then uh, I will go ahead and start calling people up that have comments they would like to make on these rule changes. So, um, the vehicle storage facility, Charles. <coughs> Which is for the record, Charles Johnson, Assistant General Counsel. Uh, you have in front of you a proposal to amend Chapter 85 of the uh, Administrative Code in response to uh, House Bill 804, which uh, has a single purpose of establishing a form of payment to the Chief of the Storage Facility. Uh, there's been substantial controversy uh, before this amendment was passed, uh, and actually since probably been here in terms of uh, what are acceptable forms of payment. The statute before the session uh, contained a reference to credit cards and the amendment in 804 also refers to credit cards uh, and we did not on a staff level see a distinction between the two uh, and so we interpreted credit card to mean as the commission has traditionally, uh, at least the department traditionally I interpreted to mean uh, the, major, the four major credit cards. It was never interpreted to mean all credit cards. Um, so that was our uh, starting point. The discussion evolved uh, and the, the advisory board agreed or approved uh, the posting of the current rule in the, in the form in which you, you I guess a little dicey here in, in that the advisory board um, did not agree with the proposition that all credit cards were required. Uh, but they, they authorized and approved the publication of the rule uh, with the limited um, definition that, we, that was proposed and, and, and approved by the advisory board. Comments were filed, uh, and there were approximately half a dozen comments. The heart of the issues is the credit card issue. Uh, the other issues, uh, as you see in your packet, are issues that uh, are either required by the statute, there's nothing we can do about it, or um, um, we were able to address through, through clarifications. Focusing on the heart of the, the, the real issue, which is the credit card issue. In the comments that came through, two comments I think were, were, were persuasive uh, and, and at the advisory board uh, last month, we recommended that they pull back the provision with the definition of a credit card, uh, which is in 85.10.6, uh, and again in 85.711A. Based on the comment, uh, we stopped, one of the sponsors of the bill uh, commented that his intent in passing the, the legislation was to require all credit cards to be accepted. And so with that uh, comment, the analysis on our end stopped. 
Uh, and and so <coughs> at the advisory board, uh, we recommended that they withdraw or, or, or pull back the definition of credit card uh, in response to the comment. The advisory board, uh, and I recommend this to them wants to do that. The to not do that? To do it. Oh, to, do to, it. To, to delete the definition of credit card in response to the comment. Uh, the advisory board voted to recommend to you that the rule be adopted with the credit card definition modified. And the modification was to say that uh, the credit cards would have to be domestic credit cards. They were concerned with international credit cards versus domestic credit cards. But that was kind of beside the point. Because if the interpretation is that it applies to all credit cards, then whether it's limited domestic or international becomes not a real issue. So our analysis stopped at the comment expressing the, the intent of the legislator who was, I guess, intramural in, in, in getting the bill passed, uh, which was to say that you know, his intent was to apply to all credit cards. And so we recommend that you adopt the rule as published with the exception of the definition of credit cards, which is in 85.10 subsection 5 and 85.711 subsection A would be deleted. Uh, and we would ask you to, to, to pass the, to adopt the rule uh, with those exceptions. Any questions for Charles? <clears throat> uh, I'm reading the letter here that we received from the uh, author of the bill. <coughs> Basically asking the same thing, did not uh, designate what credit cards should be a form of payment, but simply say all credit cards. Yes, sir. Um, I'm also reading some comments about the convenience fee. Yeah, that was one of the issues that, that I, I characterized as imposed by the statute. But the statute doesn't, doesn't authorize the collection of a convenience fee or service fee. And that's been one of the big issues that, that was discussed at the private board level. And that these, these companies are required to, to uh, accept credit cards and they can't distinguish which ones they want to accept because some have a higher service fee than others right. and they can't pass those cards on so they were opposed to that like, the, the interpretation of all credit cards. Uh, but it, again, in light of the comment uh, we received uh, expressing the intent of the legislation, uh, we back off of that and recommended that uh, the definition be excluded. So, so are we going in agreement with Representative Skarin? Yes, ma'am. Any further questions for Charles? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. So the way it stands now, um, and the rule that you want us to adopt, is that the definition of all credit cards, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. No, I'm, I'm sorry. You, your, your question was, you want to accept all credit cards? Mm -hmm. All yes, credit cards. Yes. And, and, and then that's a must. They must accept all credit cards? Yes, sir. Every credit card yes, in sir. existence today? Yes, sir. And the issue that you're wrestling with, we're wrestling with as well, uh, which is why we came up with a definition to try and limit or, or confine the universe, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that each of those credit cards come with a service fee attached to it to the to the the, 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 the vendor, and so we were trying to. And, and I struggle with this one too because in in the, in, the, in the marketplace, um, you know, American Express may charge you know four yes. percent, and Visa will charge three percent. And so vendors or retailers will stop using the 4% because they don't want to absorb the cost or they don't want to pass that on to their customer. And they'll just use the Visa network or the MasterCard network because it's cheaper yes. for the customer in the long run and it's cheaper for them. And so now we're taking that option away, correct? We, I don't want to say we're taking it away uh, because I think the, the with, in, in the current environment, that could be a yes, in the current environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a result of the statute and, and not anything that we've done on, on agency level. Yeah, I understand. Because the author of the bill has stated all credit cards. Yeah, yeah. But the intent is to accept all credit cards. Credit cards, debit cards, everything. So, but is it, real, is it established that they can get the, the fees back? I mean, is it saying yes or no? No. That, that's the Do other issue. Do not the ability to, to get the extra fees back? Yeah, that, that's one of the issues that the, the comments raised in terms of being able to recover the, the, the service fees. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look, look at the statute carefully, it says that the only thing they, they, can, they can recover are the fees authorized by 2303 and 2308. Uh, and service fees are not in either of those two statutes. Commissioner, just you know, bear in mind that 
Um, this is one of those unusual moments. Mm -hmm. Statutorily, we do not have a provision for the electricians that says you must take credit cards. We don't have a provision for electricians that says here are the only fees you can charge. It is unique to the, the towing and the vehicle storage facility industries. Uh, and that's when you run into these very unique discussions uh, that you're having right now, which is, I mean, you're going to hear testimony, and it's going to talk about the impact of small business folks. Um, and it's going to talk about, you know, the, the, the profit margins, and we've wrestled with that as well. Um, is, is there so now we're glad that you get to wrestle. Yeah. Is, there, is there any way we could just kind of um, accept major credit cards, that sort of thing? Or are we putting too fine a point on it by saying all credit cards? Um, that was the goal. Kind of let, the, level, and let the marketplace kind of decide. <coughs> on a staff level, we had the same discussion that, that you had, and which is why we proposed in the original publication to define credit card as being the four major credit cards. Okay. That was that was that was our starting point. But in response to that starting point, the comments came back was that the intent of the legislation was to to require all credit cards. So that's why we find ourselves in this dilemma, and that we, we acknowledge uh, the um, loss of income or revenue for the facilities who have to take credit cards with a higher expense than they will otherwise uh, uh, elect to do. Uh, and we have to kind of back off of that in, in light of the interpretation that it, it, it would apply to all credit cards. So we, we appreciate and understand the dilemma uh, and the hardship that this may cause, but. Uh, Strictly reading the, the, the statute, we're going to back off and say that that maybe uh, there's no need to, to define credit card. This is a better bill as well. Yes, sir. Any further questions or troubles to the what, is, you, I mean, so many concerns. So what if a network? There are different types of credit cards, and if you have to, if you have to accept every credit card, you have to have every network. Yes, sir. And and that may be two or three different. Uh, processing stations yes, sir. That with was, which to swipe a credit card. That was one of the, the issues was that uh, the equipment to process credit cards is not free. Uh, and and the, 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 the servicing of those credit cards is not free. And so we're kind of taking away the, uh, the ability of the of, of facility owner to elect which of the credit cards uh, they, they would elect to take. Uh, we had a comment which would suggest that uh, the, the, the decision be left to the to the facility owner as to which credit card uh, they would be uh, authorized to take, but th that would be inconsistent with the, the with the, the, the comment expressing the intent of the legislation, which was to require all credit cards. I mean, you know, I don't. It's hard for me to believe that the, they said they meant all credit. I mean, there are so many credit cards out there. It, it, it little obscure credit cards that we will never hear about um, that are kind of a niche market. Yes, sir. And, you know, I served on the Credit Union Commission for eight years, um, and I can tell you, I mean, we're looking at hundreds of credit cards uh, from all around the country. I can only say, Mr. Bowler, that you, you're, you're pitched to the point. Uh, okay. We started with that position that uh, there should be some parameters around those credit cards, which is why we came up with the definition try to define it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in response to the comments, uh, I, I think that, that if, unless you find that the term credit card is ambiguous, uh, which we were kind of in that position, uh, we are kind of boxed into to the all credit card type position. So you're saying right now to approve with the exception of that credit card clause? Yes, sir. Uh, when an effective date of January 1, 2016. I'm reading the legislation, but that was a question that Commissioner Yoko had, had said. It says the operator of the vehicle shall, this is the change language, each of the following forms of payment, cash, debit card, and credit card. And that's all it states. Yes, sir. And so it we're taking. Say all. This is cash, Correct. debit card, and debit card. I think we're reading. I think it's because the state representative tried to, I mean, his comment was all credit cards. And he, he's saying that the intent that was for all. He's saying that's his intent. So, I mean, is, is, it, is the responsibility now upon us to say major credit cards and run the risk of, 
them contrary to what the intent was? I, and I don't think, I think that the, the question of optional reports, I think that it's saying now that legal services doesn't have to take credit cards. I think the question is, is can we define, as we were trying to do, what credit card is, which we were saying it was Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. Yes. And, and is it okay for us to say they didn't define all credit cards in the statute? Therefore, do they leave it upon our reasonable judgment to say the major credit cards? Um, that's where we were. On, that's where we were prior to the to the publication. I, I, you know, I mean, just being a little bit rational because these fees cannot be cannot be passed on to the customer. Correct. They must be absorbed. So if you must accept every credit card, if the fee is ten percent to the vehicle storage facility, that vehicle storage facility is now taking ten percent off their gross revenue. Yes, sir. And they and have it becomes a onerous for the small business guy, and it becomes okay. So I. I Mr. Chairman, they have a second issue as well. Um, Chris, well yeah, so yes. I mean, one one of the things that could be done was we could uh, ask for an attorney general's opinion about what the term credit card means in the statutory language. Whether that is a term to be left up to the the vendor, the the, the BSF, or whether it's left up to the commission. Or whether it is all credit cards, uh, uh, we we do have that letter from the the author of the bill. What his intent was, and he is a businessman. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what does the department accept in terms of credit cards? How about everything the department accepts in terms of payment? Well, that was that was part of the, the discussion as well. Because that's fair and reasonable. If they're if they're paying for their fee, their licenses by credit card, if we're holding them to that standard. Um, you know that's that's a reasonable option. That's a marketplace option. That's something that y'all chosen to say. <coughs> this is a reasonable credit card to take. Um, and these are the four or five credit cards that we'll accept. Um, that's a decent standard, I would think. I think Chris Miller is that you have to look at it, I guess, in, in a larger context as well. And, and that um, I think Brian made a comment earlier about the, the uniqueness of the statute. This is one of the only few statutes that I've ever encountered where the fees that can be charged are actually inserted into the statute. And, and so the statute, the statute dictates how much they can recover on a daily basis for storage fees. And you've got another statute that says that they can only collect from the vehicle owner fees that are authorized by the two statutes, 2308 and 2303. And there's no reference anywhere to recovery of those service fees. And so they're in that dilemma where all their fees are regulated by, by statute. Uh, and now this interpretation is that, that the, the, the convenience fees can be passed on because they're not a part of Authorized by those, those two statutes. See, I think, uh, you know, also as a business person, I, would, I, I think what you recommended we should do that. I think it's really up to us as business people to determine how, you know, we you know, we work on, we, we accept our cards in our own businesses and we determine how to do that based on what services we have, how we process. So I think that, I think we should adopt the rule as recommended. We do have some comments. Uh, if the commissioners are okay with that, I'll just make some of those people not to wait for them. Okay. I'll just kind of speak. Rose, good. Oh, we good. Go ahead. Have a if you don't mind, uh, state your name for the record. And I know you are here to talk about the credit cards. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, we've got comments, but we need to go through. Go ahead. Good morning, well, still morning so far, <laughs> Chairman Commissioners. My name is Rose Goot. Um, I'm here today on behalf of my business, Goot Towing and Recovery in Columbia, Texas, as well as the Texas Towing and Storage Association. Um, Texas Towing and Storage Association is the oldest and most representative association for the towing and vehicle storage industry in the state of Texas. For more than 40 years, GTSA has worked for the Texas legislature and executive branch agencies to promote a fair and safe climate for our customers and a healthy business environment. Ms. Gill, I, I hate to interrupt you, but we are about to lose it. So, I'm fixing so, to give you my so, point. So I just want everybody to know where I'm right at. right to the point so we can go from there. The vast majority of vehicle of motor, the vast majority of vehicle storage facilities are small businesses, many of which have been owned and operated by the same family for generations. 
Our company has been in business for 29 years and we have 15 employees. The cost of operating a BSF are the same as most other businesses. Wages, benefits, property, facilities, insurance, and However, unlike most other businesses, we are required by law to operate 24 hours a day. Business practices are specified in statute, as are, as are the rates that can be charged, and the last time the rates were increased was 2005. Therefore, any increase in the cost of doing business is substantial to our industry. GPSA did support Hospital 804, and most BSFs already accept credit cards. However, we did not understand that we were advocating our ability to make <coughs> business decisions regarding the vendors that we do business with. Credit card company merchant fees and their requirements vary greatly among the various types of credit cards, and choosing the appropriate vendor is a business decision. Um, I looked yesterday and at, at hours, just a quick glance at, at, at a one month deal, and, and you're looking at, you know, like, like, like you mentioned, there's probably 25 different visas, 10 or 15 different MasterCards, every one of them, they charge you your percentage rate for taking the card. They charge you a per unit thing, whether it's 10 cents to 50 cents a card, and then they charge you another fee, which is an assessment fee. All of these fees are fees, like they said, that come straight off the top of our business. There's no way to recoup them. And so, you know, I think that when we make those decisions, because you can look at those little rates with the merchant people and you can see that if you take Diners Club, you're looking at 8.6%. Or mm -hmm. if you're looking at a visa, you're looking at 1.75. So therefore, I think that we need to be really, really cautious when we make that decision, because it is going to impact us. Because not, not only is the John Q. public who gets their car impounded gonna come down and wanna give you a credit card, but then you're gonna have all of the, the, uh, the insurance auto options, the salvage people want to get credit cards, and when you take every car you release on an accident over a credit card, you just put yourself out of business. There's absolutely no way that the towing industry can hold, can hold up to that. And I believe that the intent of that lawmaker was for John Key Public, not for corporate America. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chesney. Chairman and Commissioner, my name is Andy Chesney. I am here today on behalf of my business, Euless Denby Record Service in Euless, Texas, and representing the Texas Toy and Story Association. Uh, I've been in business, well, my business has been in the family 61 years. We have 38 employees, and Right now, we do take credit cards, but it's the credit cards, the major credit <coughs> cards that I choose in. Uh, we, we can't charge a fee, so TDA Law said we can't charge a fee for it. Although, when I get a oversized permit, state charge me a fee. I have an annual permit, but they charge me $90 to use a credit card on a $4,000 annual permit fee, but yet I cannot <coughs> charge a fee. Uh, it, it, it's funny to me that the statute always get thrown in you can't do nothing about it because that's what is in the statute the statute does not say every credit card it's just credit card T, uh, TTSA was for house bill 804 so it said take credit cards if it said to take every credit card we might not have been for it. We not, might not have supported it. So the statute does not say that to take every credit card, it says to take credit card. So now to say we got no choice because that's what the statute says, but we was we supported that bill. If it said every credit card that's made on this earth, we probably wouldn't have been supported. We would have been there to testify. We had a chance then to testify against this if it said every credit card. Mr. Chesney, have you had a chance to look at the letter that Representative Garrett sent to us? When yes. When submitted his comment? Yes. Okay. I, because he did say But that's that. after the right. statute. No, I agree with Dumb with you. Not I mean, that's after he did say that. Somebody told him what to say, maybe. I don't know. But, and I'm I did see the letter. Okay. Uh, but 
then again, if it was at the legislature, we would have been there to say, as a business people, we can't afford this. If we have vehicles out there that we have to swap the card, and we gotta have that machine in every truck, every truck, and for every card, <laughs> we got a stack of machines that we can't keep it. And bear in mind, as an as a association, we have majority of our people are mom paw operation, three or four trucks. They can't afford, in a little bitty town, they can't afford to pay credit card fees like this and not be in, be in birth in any way. I mean, it is, it's so, hard Charles, on Charles, I think the recommendation that we have before us is if we took, if they took a credit card, as long as they took a credit card, that seemed like that would meet the, you know, meet the tenor of doing business. And that's what we're doing. Just a question, Charles, I think you had a question. Yeah, I, well, it was more of a comment than a oh, question. I think I'm, like I'm struggling with this as Mr. Butler is. Um, I didn't read it as all credit cards, so if, that, if that's the way that we're reading it, does that mean cash would mean all cash would include Indian <laughs> rupees and pesos and all that other stuff? I'm, and I'm, I'm making a little bit of levity of this, but I think, I think we need to be a little bit more reasonable about this. The, the nomenclature credit card to any consumer may, you know, means major credit cards. I mean, that's how I look at it. You go to any shop, any retail center, uh, you know, it doesn't, credit card doesn't refer to every possible credit card that's been issued by any possible bank forever. And that's just a comment, just, just a thought for the commission. Mr. Chen, did you have anything, I mean, Mr. Chen, did you have anything else that you want uh, to say? Not on credit card, uh, we, our association or the towing industries need some help. We haven't had a raise on anything since 2005. Uh, we had an environmental fee passed, voted on and passed. And it's been years, we ain't got a fee yet. Right, but we're talking about the credit card. I understand that. But, <laughs> I understand. And, and we, just and we got, but the stuff that we want to get through, we can get through, mm -hmm. but we got this passed and we ain't got a fee. So the stuff we don't want to get through, I don't know where it goes. Just okay. coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. I've got one more, Holly Winwood. Well. Hey. Holly Holly I'm from Fat Boy Towing out of New Braunfels, Texas. And uh, we have currently 22 employees. Out of respect for time and not wanting to repeat um, the question interpretation of the law and how it has been presented to us. Uh, just some hardcore quick average monthly numbers for Fat Boy Towing. A uh, dollar for per police rotation, we average $1,200. It potentially could increase that to $1,200. Um, with our other business that we accept, uh, could be right at $2,200. We work on an average of 10% margin. Whenever you're looking at $3,200 additional fees, it really cuts into that margin. It makes it very, very hard for business to progress. So I do encourage that we look at very hard at the interpretation of it and the acceptance of credit cards and the fees. Thank you. Um, there being no further comments, um, I can tell you that, again, for just to, in light of the uh, time frame, I, I think that uh, our executive director is on to something about requesting from the attorney general. Uh, I think I've read the legislation, and just for purposes, it simply says that that uh, shall accept each of the following forms of payment, cash, debit card, and credit card. That's all it says. And of course, I'm reading this, and it says that they should be taking a credit card, but that's all it says. If you want to just take Visa, you just take Visa. If you want to take Master, whatever. That's the way I'm making it. But I think that in light of what we're at, where we're here, I think that we simply pass the rules without the exception of the definition, but then go to the Attorney General and ask for an opinion from the Attorney General as to credit card in order to be able to expedite this and be able to get what we need to from the uh, uh, vehicle storage facility industry 
Because I agree, I think it's going to be great burdensome if you have to take Diner's Club or if you have to take, you know, Mike's credit card. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very burdensome because I'm in debt with about 25%. So, uh, <laughs> I don't really like that one, I'm just kidding. But I think that we need to do that, Commissioner Michelle. Yeah, so just, just to your point, um, is it even necessary to send this back or, or send this up to the Attorney General's office for an opinion? I mean, the Commission, in its own reasonable sense, can make a motion as it sees fit. Am I not correct? And, and I guess that's true. <coughs> I think just in light of the letter from the author of the legislation, we didn't want to stop this like that. Mm -hmm. But it could be that, that the Commission simply says, credit card, that's all it is, and if someone else chooses to request an opinion, they could. Maybe if I can ask staff, maybe put some, some guidance on this. Mr. Bowman, please. This is Brad Bowman, General Counsel. What's before you today is adopting the proposed rule. So that's really the decision point that, that you're at. And what we're recommending, what we recommended is to adopt the rule, proposed rule, but removing the credit card definition that was proposed in the, in the rule which would then just default to the statute, which says Correct. the language that's, that's been, been read. And I understand there's a question about how to interpret that. Um, and uh, that, that's really what's in, in front of you today, is okay. the decision on adopting these rules. Okay. Um, and then there could yeah, be further like to go discussion that. about uh, requesting an AG opinion if that's, if that, if that's of interest. But right. I'd like to go ahead and make the motion that we adopt the rule as recommended. With the, with the, the and that leaves out the definition of credit card. Yes. As recommended, uh, we've heard that. Okay. That's so a motion. motion. We have a motion on board. I'll second that motion. And a second. Uh, no further discussion. Okay. Oh. I, you know, I think what, we could use some common sense here, but I also have a, I, 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 I think what bothers me more than anything is telling them how to run their business, and, they, and if they want to use credit cards, it's up to them. Which uh, yeah, so you know, so um, I, I agree. We're going to support it. So uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. So basically, what we have from this commission is that VSF began to start accepting credit cards. We're not defining what that is. So if you could, um, uh, with effective date, I guess with January first. Yeah. January first, yes. Part of it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Real Thank quickly, you. Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. Clarification. The, the rule you just adopted, did you also adopt the, the advisory board's recommendation to limit the, limit the credit cards to domestic? That wasn't a part of the rule. Was it a part of the rule? It, 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 it was not. That's what I'm clarifying. Was it a part of the rule? No. No. Okay. okay. It wasn't part of the rule. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, uh, item T, which is the approval of the appointments. Commissioner, do you have before you? Uh, appointments, advisory board appointments that I bring before you to appoint Cynthia Comparian to the Dietitian Advisory Board. Uh, this is a recommendation by Commissioner Roadwall, so I appreciate you submitting that to us. Which reminds me, if you have anybody that you'd like to please let me know. The Orthotist and Prosthetist Advisory Board, David Ahrens out of Denton, Texas. And then under the Speech Language Pathologist and Audiologist Advisory Board to appoint uh, Michelle Tejana as the audiologist and Carl Hummel as a public member. Do you have that before you? So move that. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, second, five, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, because we're about to lose four. Or actually, we're about to lose four. Uh, going back. Appreciate it. Let's go ahead and go back to R, which is the staff reports. Bill? Mr. Chairman, Bill Coons, your executive director. Um, on the, uh, I'm going to let Brian give the new program implementation, but let me give the other parts of the presentation. On presentations and outreach, we had a, a great meeting with the uh, Driving School Association of America's International. Um, that the, our staff was there, Amanda Booth. Uh, I was asked to be a keynote speaker and, and went for an overview of what TDLR does, uh, how we uh, create efficiencies, and what they can expect when uh, uh, they become part of our licensees. And I think that, that went very well. Uh, in addition to that, we've got uh, outreach pieces that are going uh, to the, oh, we had the advisory board summit that was October the 28th and 29th. Uh, that was well attended by the uh, numerous 
advisory board appointees, we had it over a two-day period because we had so many appointees to go through the process with. Staff made the presentations, and, and that was extremely well received by the advisory board. Uh, the, uh, the process, I think, was important because uh, many of the boards over the Department of State Health Services were policy boards, and there was a real change in the moving from a policy board to an advisory board and, and to convey to them what the processes were at TDLR, how we do uh, seek the guidance from those experts and, and want to make sure that, that we pay attention to the uh, expertise, technical expertise that we get from the advisory boards. So I think that that, uh, that was very well. Uh, upcoming on the 23rd of this month, the Executive Women in Texas Government uh, has their conference. I'll be a speaker uh, for that. Uh, on December the 1st, the Governor's Executive Development Program has me on the uh, speaking for the CEO panel. Uh, that's always a good uh, panel to uh, talk to the uh, people that have taken that course. Uh, the Ray Pizarro is in that class this year, so it's it's always fun to have uh, one of our employees in the, in the audience when I'm uh, giving that speaking uh, presentation. Uh, December the 9th, uh, I'll be visiting the Torres uh, unit in Hondo, Texas, and going to prison outreach, talking to the prisoners about what they can expect for licensure, given that they have a criminal background, uh, what the process is for applying for a predetermination letter, but also which criminal backgrounds have an impact on the different licenses so they don't waste their time studying for and hoping that they can become licensed in a particular field when in fact that particular conviction that they have is something that's uh, of great concern to that particular uh, uh, license that uh, has recommended by the advisory boards. Uh, Bill, can I ask you a question about that? Yes, sir. Chair. Uh, we had the Wyndham School District, uh, 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 just as I came on the board a couple of years ago, we were kind of addressing some of those issues. And uh, I think y'all were supposed to get with them and, and kind of give them a list, right? Right, and with Wyndham, we had an extensive process of going out and doing that outreach. Right. Wyndham then was not funded by the legislature, so they went out of existence. Mm -hmm. uh, but we continued that uh, process so that uh, even without uh, Wyndham's uh, financial support from the legislature that we've been able to go uh, to visit with the prisons because that's going to save us time and it's going to save uh, the individuals uh, time and, and money. And I think that the case that, that came up a couple of years back was that an individual that had come out of uh, prison, uh, he had two rape convictions, a great aggravated rape. Uh, he'd gone to uh, the uh, agency for uh, rehabilitative services. They, yeah, they paid months. for his barber school and then he came to us and said, you're, you're denying my license. Uh, the testimony, though, in the uh, hearings for the aggravated rape was that on the second victim that he had raped her at gunpoint, said if, to her, if you say anything about this, I'll kill you. Uh, that was a pretty powerful testimony. And even though he had gone through and gotten the state education on barbering, that he was not the type of individual that we wanted to give a license to. Uh, we, uh, because of that, we've established a very tight relationship with the um, Department of uh, Rehabilitative Services so that they do the predetermination letter now for all of the people before they uh, spend the money to educate them in a particular license. Great. So that we've got a very close relationship there. Uh, those have been real good things that have happened uh, in, that, in that process. So this yes, is a continuation of that. If I could correct something. Um, Bill speaking about Project Rio that no, wasn't right. funded. Rio, Wyndham right, School right. still exists. Right. It's still out there doing it. Well, I was shocked to, when you said that. I don't want them to think that they have to shut down and stop teaching us. Yeah, yeah. I know Rio yeah. is not. It was a Project Rio, that's right. So those are the things that are on the horizon for uh, public speaking. And then for staff development, the, the latest book uh, is uh, It's Not What You Sell, It's What You Stand For. As Bill Spouse uh, um, <coughs> GSDM uh, advertising agency wrote that. It's an excellent book. Uh, it goes through vision, uh, its core values, but it then reaches down to purpose. What is your purpose? And I think that's going to be our next uh, book club uh, discussion. Uh, I've uh, got a focused uh, 
part on this where we can just focus on certain uh, segments of that book so that those that really apply to TDLR. But, uh, that's something that will be coming up uh, soon. Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Commission members, first of all, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, it's really been a, an interesting day. You guys have had a lot on your plate in this uh, buffet called uh, TDLR. Um, in regard to the transitions of the new programs, uh, we always think about the health health related programs. Well, the program that we have here is the driver's uh, training program, and I want to start off talking about that that effort. Um, we, we were able to bring some key staff members on board, and you've heard us introduce them to you. Uh, the efforts of learning that program and providing the services to the, uh, the schools and the providers and the instructors and ultimately the, the people that are getting the education from them, it's going very well. Uh, tomorrow's going to be a, a really good moment for us. Uh, we'll have the first ever advisory board for that industry or those industries coming together. Um, you've always had parent taught in one place, you had drivers safety and drivers education in the same place but still see themselves as different. Uh, they're going to be on the same board. They're going to be sitting there, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be worth the price of admission in my board uh, to have the groups together and to really start airing out and, and I think more more so focusing on what they're alike than how they're different and building a very unified pro program that in a year from now we can really be proud of and say you know we've really done some work. But it starts it started when we brought the the employees on like Kathy. Um, but it's going to really begin in earnest tomorrow that the industries will have a place that they can voice their concerns and, and hear the commission say, well, that's passed by the advisory board. Thumbs up because it's gone through the, the filter. So I'm really looking forward to that part. Uh, and talking about the drivers, I mean, the health-related programs, um, I gave you a document called a Model of Collaboration, Department of State Health Services and TDLR. The last part should be uh, DSHS plus TDLR equals success. It has been one of the most collaborative and successful exchanges that we've ever had with an agency. You would think that they would be a little bit tense about these programs have to go and losing their employees uh, from the top and all the way down through their organization as well as ours. We have worked flawlessly and seamlessly. Uh, you can see the number of meetings, the different areas of, of importance that we've had agreement on, uh, but it's been shared. We're learning how they do things, they're learning how we do things. Uh, we're adding them to the agenda for all the health programs. So there is a slot under there, under staff reports, that says a part of state health services transition. Wow. So they can air and talk about how they feel about the transition. Uh, we are putting joint statements on, on different um, uh, agendas because there's a shared membership between the midwife advisory board and the midwife board over there. And so we're actually having the post dual agenda saying that when they're meeting, it's also a meeting of the advisory board because there's a quorum that could be present in those situations. So the, the, it's been going fantastic. Um, that is putting the gloss on it. The hard work that the staff has done for uh, getting those rules um, presented to the boards has been tremendous. And it's been a lot of pressure on, on the general counsel staff. Wendy, um, <coughs> Lynn's not here, uh, Laura and Della have done an amazing job. An amazing job. And, and when I'm talking amazing job, I'm talking on the weekend, staying well past six o'clock at night, and then sitting through an 11 hour advisory board meeting, going over every line in each rule, and being on top of their game to understand what the nuances are. Um, creating something new from existing rules and putting it in a format that's never existed before. And uh, it's just been phenomenal, and I'm very proud uh, of each of them and the effort that they put into it. Um, the 11 hour meeting, only fell two hours short of the record, which was the licensed <laughs> breeders, which was 13 hours. Uh, yesterday, that meeting was flying, and uh, it was a seven hour meeting, and it was needed. It's seven hours to go through because we have to create that, that trust and, and the confidence that we're, we're not discarding their, um, uh, their work. During the 11 hour meeting, I started getting a little loopy, and so I would interject a comment. I'm like, we are moving at the speed of a sedated dragon. <laughs> oh, we're moving at the speed of a one-winged pterodactyl. You know, just kind of teasing, basically saying, let's don't go to 15. You know, well, let's try to keep it under 13. And, and, and we did. We, we had as much fun as you can have in those moments. But uh, it was really a very well, engaged. And Ryan. I would expect that tomorrow's <laughs> meeting. Ryan had as much fun as you can. I, yeah, I had as much fun as I could have in, in those moments. Um, we have one-winged pterodactyl. <laughs> the one-winged pterodactyl. Um, 
we have had more advisory board meetings in this month than we've ever had. And we're gonna be in that same spot in February when they come back for that second bite after the comments have been out there. Uh, these industries, uh, some of them have been super engaged, really engaged. I'm looking forward to the level of comments that we'll get back from it. Uh, yesterday's discussion was enlightening. Uh, it was not a, a rubber stamp. It was an educational experience for both groups. And the rules that we finished up with are better as a result of the conversations that we've had with the people. Uh, the chairman did a good job of identifying uh, some very um, talented members, uh, but they do not think alike. And that's been the beauty of it. Uh, the one person says, I think it should be X, and the other one says, is it a bold X or a capital X, or why don't we use Y, and, and the discussions happen. And that has allowed for uh, them to come to consensus versus one voice dominating the conversation. Um, but we've got some work to do, and, and you guys are going to see the, the benefit of it. Uh, we will have the advisory board drafts for the health rules uh, before you in, at your March 10th meeting, uh, and that's when you guys will take them up. So we've got that much work to do uh, before they come to you. I would also uh, ask the commissioners, in the event that there uh, is a particular advisory board that they would like to uh, be the liaison for to let me know that, because uh, I have been attending the new advisory boards that we've had and uh, but only because it's it's new but uh, I am looking to be able to have liaison from the commissioner to those advisory boards uh, as the last probably three weeks has shown uh, if it not been because of my current position there's no way that I've been able to attend them and we rely on the other commissioners to do that. so if there's one take a look at it uh, but I will be uh, explaining those so if you're interested in a particular advisory board let me know so I know which one to, to kind of get you on Mr. Chairman, the last thing I'll say is that <clears throat> with the re restructuring that we did um, in exec with Tamla Delia and Mary Winston providing the advisory board support, um, we could have done it sooner. It's really worked out well. The, the boards are getting the level of attention and respect they need for being the volunteers that we rely so heavily on. And then the last person that I have to point out that is uh, um, always going to have the brunt of all the work that we speed through ultimately has to be processed by uh, Pauline easily and she is uh, she's a star in her own right she's the one that does the, the rule filings and makes sure everything's just right with the Texas Register uh, she's helped us work through some of the logistics on when the rules should go forward I had uh, a ridiculously aggressive unnecessarily burdensome uh, schedule for uh, the GC's office and they were uh, brave enough uh, to confront me with it and smart enough to, to bring me information in and answer that, that made it a little bit more work the staff's been great. Speaking of staff, we of course uh, want to continue to, to wish Gene well and I hope to have him back soon. So. Mm -hmm. He's doing great. Do we, is that it for our staff? Report? We have a D Mater uh, for IT that will do the staff show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you were you fell asleep during the meeting. <laughs> 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 That's a heck of a way to start. Woo, great start. <laughs> hey, Dean, just before you get started, uh, Bill and Brian, kudos to you guys. Uh, this is such a hard thing to do. Bring in all these programs the way y'all are doing, and it's, it's you guys are so humble and so willing to listen to what other people have to say, uh, and I think that's why it, it has gone as well as it has. Uh, you don't always act like you're the smartest guys in the room, although oftentimes you are, unless Mike's in it uh, <laughs> or Deborah. Often, not all. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I think that's why it's gone so well, and I appreciate that. And it's it's just always been a point of pride with me that you guys are that willing to listen to what others have to say and, and uh, uh, incorporate you know the good things that they do have uh, to make this department run better. And I think it's a testament to to, to how well it runs because of you guys. So. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Dean Vetter, and I'm the Information Technology Director. I've been on board here for about a year now. I think this is my first time to speak before you guys, although we did meet when I first came on board. Uh, I know you're at the end of a long day, and there's an awful lot going on in IT, but I did want to just hit on some high points and then give you guys the opportunity to ask questions if you have any about what's going on. Uh, when I came on board last October, one of the first things that I noted was that there was really no uh, formal IT governance or portfolio management process. So one of the first priorities for me 
was to put that in place. And I won't say it's fully mature at this point. We've got a ways to go. But we do have a governance body that consists of most of the division directors. And we are tracking projects now. Uh, we have a project man, two project managers on board now. And they actually work with the developers and the people in network services, assignments folks, to keep track of all the ongoing projects, plan projects, so things don't just fall off the radar screen, as I believe they have at some points in the past. So we're refining that process. The IT governance team has met, I think, four times now with some meetings in between to talk about how we're going to prioritize projects because we really haven't refined that yet. So we've got a meeting next week where hopefully we can hone in on what are the criteria that we use to prioritize projects that come through our doors. And what I'm talking about is projects that are of significant scope and magnitude to where they need to be considered as a separate entity as opposed to the kind of day-to-day -day care and feeding that we do for our existing systems because that consumes about 20 to 25 percent of the folks that we've got. Um, we currently have 23 field positions in information technology. I think there were 15 or 16 when we started, so we're on a bit of a growth track. Uh, we have several additional positions that are associated with the DSHS license transfers. Uh, of course, we can't fill those yet until this funding issue has been resolved. <coughs> and then we had uh, three or four new positions that were a result of funding that we got for uh, the security assessment that Gartner performed a couple of years ago. Actually, we got six FTEs for that total plus <coughs> funding. So we're, we're on a bit of a growth track. Um, addressing security issues that were uh, identified in that assessment is a high priority for us, and we're going to apply those resources to that. Um, we uh, also have some security issues that have arisen since that. Uh, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but there's an issue with server 2003, which is the server operating system that operates most of the servers that we have in our environment, including our web servers. And those are going to be unsupported by Microsoft in about a year. And so a big uh, initiative for us is to upgrade those servers and the applications that run on them to server 2012, which is taking uh, about a hundred resources to accomplish. The other uh, big projects that are going on for us center around the incorporation of the driver education safety programs into TGLR. That has taken a lot of our staff's work. Uh, we brought in an entire uh, access application that was being used by ESC 13 to manage drivers in over there. And it wasn't exactly a perfect refined pro process project, so we've had to do a lot of work to incorporate that in. Uh, install it on people's workstations, train people until we get to do what TDLR wants it to do. Uh, we also put in an online system through which individuals can apply for and pay for uh, the uh, parent talk packets for driver's education, and that's in place. We still are working on an online system through which they can apply for the certificates, the driver schools can apply for the certificates. That's the biggest gap that we have. We're looking at having that done by December. Uh, the other really big initiative is going to be the DSHS initiative, and there's a lot that's on hold because of the funding, but what a lot of my work has been on in the past several months was, first of all, doing the fiscal analysis on that because we needed to know what the impact of bringing those programs was going to be in on the technology side, and then working with DSHS and the company that provides that software that they use to them. Uh, to figure out how we're going to be able to migrate the infrastructure and the software and the existing configurations and data over for GDLR to use. And as was mentioned earlier, there's actually going to be a procurement associated with that. And it's going to be a procurement of some significance. It's going to take a couple of months to accomplish once we start. Uh, and so what I've been working on a lot is the statement of work associated with that. And that's for the services and the licenses required to bring over that software, which it's a company called Micropact, and the software is called Versa. And there are six state agencies using it. It's one of the most common state agency used software for licensing systems. <coughs> um, so that's going to take quite a bit of work to get that over here. Uh, we've had a lot of successes uh, in the past year. You've got a really good team of IT folks over there. Um, we've had one resignation since I started, and that was about two weeks after I left, so I don't feel responsible for that one. Um, and we've been able to retain the staff that we've got 
and add several new highly qualified staff in a very difficult recruit, recruiting and hiring uh, situation here in Austin. Uh, we've got several new developers. We've got a new network guy that's very strong. I've uh, had just two project managers that have been very, very uh, strong and experienced project managers. So uh, I feel fortunate that we've done that. And I think that the two directors, Simon and James Corral, who's over from software development, have done a really good job selecting new folks. And I'll give myself a pat on the back for the two PMs and a new security guy. So uh, I think we're on the growth track, we're on the positive improvement track, and we've got a lot of successes under the belt. Um, we're just we're keeping up and trying to get ahead at the same time. Do y'all have any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Dee. Good work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Now move on to uh, advisory board. Uh, you have a report. Um, and in the interest of time, unless you've got questions, we can probably bring Jeff up here. But, uh, you may be a speaker in the back also. Uh, but if not, you have the advisory report in front of you also. I can tell you this, uh, I have, uh, I've always appreciated the advisory boards, but in this particular position that we're now doing and going through uh, these new advisory boards, I have a, a greater appreciation for advisory boards with the expertise that they bring to the particular field. And, uh, and I can tell you that they, uh, they fight for their industry, which is exactly what we want them to do. So I have an even greater appreciation. So I know that we do have some out in the audience, and I appreciate you uh, willing to serve. Because uh, as I told them, also, they, they get paid double what we get paid. <laughs> 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 Moving on to uh, public comment. At this point in time, uh, if you have just anyone out in the audience would like to make a comment, we do open up that portion of the agenda, uh, limit it to three minutes. For those that would be interested, if you don't mind coming forward, state your name and your comment. Mm -hmm. There being none, let's move on to item B, which is discussion the next day. Uh, commissioners, in your minutes, you had, and I'm not sure if you remember, put them in your calendar, but uh, we have the minutes, I'm sorry, the uh, meetings already set up into March, um, up right quick. Uh, we have a meeting on January the 6th. This is our last meeting for this calendar year. Uh, we have a meeting January 6th of 2016, January, I'm sorry, February 10th, of 2016, and March the 9th. Uh, I now have a couple other meetings I would like to propose to you. Uh, in April, we can choose either the 13th or the 20th. I'm not sure if there's a particular one that fits better than others. Uh, if you've got, I know that Mr. Shaw, you've got council meeting, but I'm not sure exactly where it falls into. So, did you say April? April, yes, 13th or the 20th. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, if there is no particular uh, one that you would like, why don't we go ahead and just tentatively schedule it? Uh, just so you know, April the 13th is Thomas Jefferson's birthday, so. In Easter earlier this year, is that you? Easter, is anyone know? Is it, is it gonna be March or April? I think uh, maybe appropriate to send an email out to you that do this session or send it out to you. March the 27th. Okay. Why don't we tentatively, just tentatively schedule the date for uh, April the 13th and then uh, another tentative date that we look at after that will be May the 8th. So those are two dates that we've set up as tentatively. Uh, Kate will send that out to all the commissioners and we'll response back. And if, if there is no objection or uh, conflict by a majority of the council and under these commissioners, then we will uh, look at April the 13th and then May the 18th. So, uh, I think we've covered every agenda item today, is that correct? Yes. That being nothing else before this esteemed body, we'll go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you.